Sounds okay? Check. Check one, two. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, thank you. Check, check. Hello everyone, I am Kassian Kene, the founder and CEO of the Dashain Foundation. I'm very honored to have each of you join us for this first edition of State of the Block. State of the Block is a non-digital business matching platform designed for the blockchain, digital twin, and digital asset industry. We have created this platform, this summit, in order to help the industry grow, mature, and finally be able to reach it's a mass adoption. So today I won't be able to join the team. I'm represented by Dalila Belkiri, Bibin Panashan, and many other members of the Datashen Foundation that are here to guide you, to support you, and provide you all the support that you may need. I'll be joining you later tomorrow in order to be able to design with you the future of this amazing opportunities that we have that is bring by the blockchain and the DLT industries. I would like to thank people from Ticom Group, Dubai SME, all the Dubai Internet CD community that are enabling us to basically um, design and write a new chapter in the blockchain and DLT as all industry story. Thank you very much and see you very soon. Well, thank you. So um, today we have two hosts. We have Professor Alejandro Macarian. Did I pronounce it well? Correct. <laughs> and handsome Hamza, that's what you said, handsome Mohammed Hamza. Yeah, Hamza. <laughs> <laughs> and for the first table of today uh, called State of the Block, we have four people. We have Mark Ugard, CEO at Quantify. This Hello. is it. Uh, Shelesh Kunat, co-founder at CTO at Mazari Capital. Morning. Good morning. And uh, after the break, we'll have Navin Sig, CEO at Inery Blockchain, and Fabrice Brassard, CEO at IC, who is also a military drone maker. So, enjoy. All right, everyone. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Uh, let me start giving a brief introduction of how this is going to play out. So we have one hour and 15 minutes for this first panel. The idea is to have a nice conversation with our guests for 50, 50 minutes, one hour, and then we'll open the mic for the, past, for the last 15, 20 minutes to the public if anybody feels like having any, any questions to them. So let's begin easily. What is blockchain? 
Actually, you know what, let me try to introduce you guys a little bit, yeah? We have some key stakeholders here. We have Coinify, which is one of the world's largest payment providers, payment service providers. Based in Denmark, they settle over millions of transactions per month and are in, correct me if I'm wrong, in over 180 countries? Yes, right. correct. So, uh, thank you for joining us, Mark, all the way from Denmark. Uh, at the same time, we have Shailesh, who is the CTO for Masari Capital. Masari Capital is basically paving the way for the UAE to you know, go a step ahead in blockchain, how the industry in the UAE actually adopts blockchain, bringing in key stakeholders in the region. So, without further ado, let Mark, please, I think you can do a better job at introducing Coinify. Tell us, what is Coinify? Yes, thank you so much for being here. Um, Coinify was dated uh, back to 2014, and uh, we have two products, uh, roughly, uh, with sub-products underneath. But the, the main product that we have is a crypto acceptance um, product, meaning that we allow merchants to accept cryptocurrencies, uh, uh, different variations of cryptocurrencies, and then we convert the cryptocurrencies receiving from the buyer back to local uh, fiat money to the merchants. So we do that for online merchants, and we also do it for uh, physical stores. And we are about to launch our product in Dubai. Uh, actually, uh, in, in a few weeks' time, we will launch our product in Dubai, meaning that we can allow physical stores to accept cryptocurrencies, and again, online stores. But we are live in 180 countries with this specific service. We also act as a broker. Uh, crypto broker, meaning that we allow individuals or uh, institutionals to buy or sell cryptocurrencies, meaning that we have uh, a direct line into market makers, exchanges globally, and then we serve anyone who wants to buy or sell. Um, our go-to-market strategy is that we are selling this, as we call, on and off ramp on the blockchain that you are buying or selling cryptocurrencies. We are selling that service to the wallets in the world uh, or exchanges. So we are service providers for wallets and exchanges. We are not a wallet, we are not an exchange. Our go-to-market strategy with our payment solution is that we are working with the classic financial institutionals that we call PSPs, the payment service providers. And we have more than 50 payment service providers globally using the Conify payment service. How do you see the, the crypto payment industry in the future? Because I personally feel that a lot of people are, I would say, hesitant to use crypto as a payment mechanism. So how do you see the industry paving off you know, in the future? Yes, um, as I said, we started our business back in 2013. Uh, so we are, we are really uh, an early adopter in this space. We have seen our payment growing year and year since 2014. Um, nevertheless, we haven't seen a real crypto payment coin yet. It is, believe it or not, still Bitcoin. That is 80, 90% of our, uh, the people are buying with. Uh, then it's Ethereum and, and some stable coins, the USDC or USDC. Um, and the funny part is that Bitcoin was meant to be a micropayment <laughs> currency, right? But it never really happened. Doesn't make a lot of sense when it goes from 60K to 50K exactly. to... Exactly. Uh, and then you have Bitcoin Cash and you have Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, you have Dash and you have a lot of different new uh, kind of uh, projects on the blockchain who tried to become a crypto payment coin or currency, right? But I still believe that we haven't seen any success in that sense. It's still people buying with Bitcoin. And it really doesn't make sense to buy with Bitcoin, especially not when it goes up, up, up. You don't want to use it as a means of payment because next day the goods you, you bought is just being much more expensive. Believe me, I bought some used speakers for my kitchen and I paid three Bitcoins for it. <laughs> <clears throat> so today it's a very expensive speaker, right? I'm so sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, it, but I love those speakers, by the way. But let me ask but, you something. Yeah, why, why don't you think stable coins took that, that role, that, that place? Yeah, stable coin might become uh, the way of 
future of cryptocurrencies. I actually believe in a few things. One thing is the stable coins. We haven't really seen that yet, but it could potentially be that we are trying out of uh, making stable coin applications on top of the blockchain, and we could see that as a success. And now you also see the CBDC, which is central bank digital currencies, trying also to build our normal national bank or government issue money using the same rails. Can you explain the, the concept a bit more for those who are not familiar with it? Yeah, you have central bank and you have your, your, your money, right? Your normal dirhams fiat and dollars and, and fiat currencies. Now they're trying to build on the blockchain or side chain a national money controlled by the government, but using the same technology, so to speak. And that potentially could be a game changer for the industry. Still yet to be seen whether they want to use it as people paying in stores with that, or it's only a settlement mechanism between uh, national banks or even central bank cross regions. So that is yet to be seen, but there is tons of new projects from the government side, trying, even in Dubai, trying to build this central bank uh, digital currencies. So we might see both that the government is issuing their own version of it, and then you will have these different decentralized Private currencies, coins. Right. Yeah. But from a monetary policy standpoint, if you have fiat currency and a particular money supply, and then you have the cryptocurrency issued by the central bank, shouldn't those two money supplies be the same? Because if not, you should have different prices for the same product in two different currencies. Yes, uh, and maybe or maybe not, depending so, on how it's picked. The, the, the question might be, perhaps put it easier. If there's inflation in the national currency, in the fiat currency, shouldn't that also be mirrored in the, in the national current cryptocurrency issued by the government? Well, there are some fundamental changes because, let's say, circling back to Bitcoin, and I really love the concept of Bitcoin still. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm religious at all with Bitcoin, but I still be believe in the scarce uh, resources that you only have X amount of cryptos that can be issued on the mm -hmm. blockchain when we're talking about Bitcoin, which can hedge against inflation and other you know, political money, as you call it, in the real world, right? We don't have money and gold in the vault anymore. We simply just print money as we see uh, fit the market conditions and suddenly you have inflation. And right now you have way too much money being printed in the world, which could be a problem. If the CBDC coins are not being a scarce resource, then potentially you just keep printing as on the as, digital yeah, exactly. metal, and then you have the same problems as you have in the, in the normal world of, you can say, normal analog money. So I'm not sure that uh, where they want to go with this. But nevertheless, it's easier to move money on the blockchain. Using even central bank digital currency money, it would be easier to settle between banks. I still find it difficult that I've, I've tried to send money from, from, from Denmark to Dubai. I, I used to be a resident in Dubai, right? And it took like 10 or 14 days to send money <laughs> because you have intermediary banks and you have all these different components sending money. It's like, really? It, it, it's still that difficult yeah. for banks? So of course they can take some of that friction out of the equation, but there's still fundamental difference between a scarcity of, of, a, of a resource of a coin compared to just printing as much as you like. And Shalesh, where do big data infrastructure providers come into all this process? You know, for me, it's essential for us to understand the beginning of the cryptocurrencies when we talk about all this. So it started with Bitcoin. And like Mark said, right, it was meant to be a peer-to-peer -peer micropayment system without any intermediaries. So me, I'm sitting in Dubai. And I could send or make a payment directly to my cousins in India or the US without any intermediary. So this was internet of money. And that's what Bitcoin is. And it was designed as internet of money. And to understand this even deeper, right? let's go back into history. Okay? What do you think is the oldest technology known to man? In your opinion? Fire? Good question. <laughs> Actually, money is the oldest technology known to man. Money even precedes 
writing. The earliest known examples of writing were spreadsheets, tally, and ledgers of what people owed, of debts. So you could even tell that money uh, was, in, uh, was actually invented because of this. You know, oh, sorry, writing was invented because of money. It was a big driver of civilization. Absolutely, absolutely. And this money being the reason why writing was invented. Imagine the, uh, the money has gone through different evolution processes, right? So initially, we had the barter system. From there, we started using commodities like gold, silver, right? And then we started using paper money. And then there was plastic money. And today, we have internet of money, which is Bitcoin. You know, so we need to understand this to understand cryptocurrencies and, and the uh, broader blockchain ecosystem. But then how do we understand if, let's talk about Bitcoin for a sec. Mm -hmm. If Bitcoin was created for this reason about you know, micropayments, how could it, you know, the price of it go up so much and eventually lose the, the, the reason the, the, that came it to be? How can we explain that? Great question. See, it's only a couple of years old. Yeah, we are still building, we are still developing. Understanding it. Yeah, understanding, right? But remember, this is programmable money. This is money where people can develop on. So for example, when somebody invented the internet, nobody knew how big this internet is going to be. So internet, you know, before the internet, there was uh, different systems for sending letters. There was different systems for pictures, there was a different system for communication. And what internet did was unified all this. Similarly, Bitcoin is unifying the new form of money. But how is it going to be in the future? We are still yet to learn. Yeah, and I was in a, in a master class back in 16 where we really tried to understand what is Bitcoin. And it actually <laughs> was with Royal Bank of Scotland and all the big banks. They have actually been with closed curtains being interested in this phenomenon for, yeah, since I remember back in, in, in even uh, 13. Um, but somebody said, and maybe it's correct, that, you know, it all happens in 2009 when uh, somebody or a group of people made a, uh, a um, kind of a letter or white paper talking about the Bitcoin and then they made the first uh, block on the blockchain, right? But maybe Satoshi did not put into the equation of greed because what happened is that suddenly you have miners and mining was an, became an industry on the whole concept. And I think that Satoshi was thinking that small laptops, mobile phones should do the mining and, and it was not an industry. Um, and and Coinify, back in, again, back in 14, 15, our biggest merchant was a uh, mining uh, facility or somebody built the chip to mine. And of course you could pay for those chips with Bitcoin. So that was a big merchant of ours. But suddenly we lost that merchant and we couldn't understand why, because the chip company, they said, why are we selling a chip that can mine Bitcoins and actually make money? So they made their own small server parks and suddenly that became a huge industry. And then there came the network fee. And then suddenly they the, the, the came in this hype that, oh, I can buy this, I can get rich. And then, then suddenly, Everything changes from a, I would still say, a beautiful idea, a beautiful concept with all the right element, internet of money, scarce uh, resource, all that good stuff, 21 million bitcoins, that's it, right? And then suddenly it became into something else. And that has been the last eight, 10 years, people trying to figure out what is this and how can we use it best possible? And we're still talking about it as for today. And maybe, maybe there's a fundamental flaw in the idea of programmable money. Because if you're trying, what is money? You were just mentioning money is perhaps one of the biggest or oldest institution in human history. Is there a, a real possible way that we can program that into code? And perhaps Bitcoin is giving us the, the answer. The answer is no. Yeah, I would, I would yeah, please. Sorry. Sorry, I just want to add something there is that, see, we've moved, like I said earlier, from paper money to plastic, now network of money. 
So Bitcoin, I want to say, is just a natural evolution of money. That's what it is. And it's still evolving. It's and I think in the last two years, the adoption of crypto, blockchain, Bitcoin has just flourished. After, obviously, the COVID, the lockdown, people realized the true potential to harness this technology. And last year, we, see, you know, we saw some really good upward you know, adoption. And I, I do agree with you. And at the same time, you know, Mark, you, you brought up the, about merchants. So my question is now, for example, you, you know, you're a payment system payment provider now. Merchants, I think, in my personal opinion, are more reluctant to adopt being paid by the users in crypto. Because, like you said, you know, the adoption of this is like, if how do the merchants actually uh, lock in their payment or the fluctuating prices of a cryptocurrency? So, say I'm a user and I want to go and pay a merchant. What ha like, how can the merchant be comfortable that he gets the exact value that he is supposed to be paid for? I totally agree. And I will have the same uh, issues as a merchant, and that's why it's difficult for, even for Coinify to adopt uh, into these merchants because they believe that it's very difficult. The truth is we're taking all that pain away, we take all that friction away from the merchants. But we quickly realized we still get merchants directly to sign up on our platform, and we just got Gucci and Yves Saint Laurent and, and Puma and a lot of the big, big fashion brands. But and they sign up directly because of a, of a purpose, which I can come back to, but that's all NFT metaverse. But uh, we just realized we needed to sell our service to the payment service providers who already are selling Visa card, MasterCard, PayPal, whatnot, to these merchants. And then they say, hey, you can actually also accept cryptocurrencies. And then say, oh, I can. Okay, <laughs> fine. Let me take it. Because then they're comfortable with the payment service providers saying it. They are afraid of taking in crypto in from the side, especially back in the days where Bitcoin was the no, no name. You could not even <laughs> say it out loud. Now we're almost back again. Um, but, um, but yes, it is difficult for merchants to understand how should I accept a fluctuating coin. So there's a lot of friction there. But we had a very good success in selling it to the payment service providers. And we just signed with Nuve, which is one of the biggest payment service providers in, in the world. So we see that it's slowly coming. And another wave on all these different technologies on top of each other, and we're only talking about Bitcoin, but we have 2,000 other tokens out there, <laughs> right? And uh, then there's Ethereum. But um, the whole NFT and the metaverse and how you can do um, user engagement, gamification with your brand, all that stuff, that derives out of the NFT world and metaverses that have also taken a new interest in accepting cryptocurrencies in their shops. So we are seeing a whole new wave of interest simply based on now all the brands want to have a place in the metaverses, issue NFTs, and, and get a new engagement with their audience. And do you see in the future that, say, on a wide scale, all the merchants globally just accepting crypto payments and the traditional fiat is no more there? I don't believe we will get rid of fiat at any point unless you don't have any countries because countries are the main purposes to take taxes. <laughs> no, there's not a lot of taxes in UA. Government, uh, not, not, not countries. Government. Yeah, 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 governments take taxes and then they protect your, 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 your house and you have a police and you have all that good stuff. So it all combines with that. But I believe that you will have a lot of new, you can say, branded money. You have uh, gaming uh, economies where huge game, even metaverse gaming, where you have issued a special token that you can earn by doing stuff, and then you can use it in the real world. So I think that one thing is you can pay with different country-based monies, and then you have like 10,000 different branded money. I believe that you will have Coca-Cola coin in a moment. <laughs> Uh, that every time you buy a Coke, you can scan something and you get two coins. And when you have 2,000 coins, a company like Coinify will be able to use that as means of payments. If Coke, Cola are saying all these coins are equal to X money on an account, similar to back in the days you have paper money and you have gold in the vault, mm -hmm. but as long as there's somebody who put a real value to the tokens, we can put that into a checkout window where you can pay with these coins because then we take the coins and we exchange that to real money by Coca-Cola. Or perhaps not necessarily into like a reserve currency like gold, but Coca-Cola's money will be backed by Coca-Cola bottles. Exactly. Something like that. Yeah. 
exactly. So branded monies in different ways, as you said, it can be programmable. And even Coca-Cola, let's stick to that topic, they can even say you cannot use it for adult material, you cannot use it for this and this and that, because you can program money to say, no, it's not allowed to do these things, it's only allowed to buy these things. Maybe Coca-Cola money is only to donate for a better world. Or to buy new Coca-Cola. Yeah. But let me ask you something. I want to ask two things now. First, on this related topic, wouldn't like having so many cryptocurrencies make cryptocurrencies redundant? Like, why would you want a Coca-Cola cryptocurrency? And the second one, touching a topic that we were just discussing, is government an ally or an enemy of cryptocurrencies? So I would like to add to this, right? So, see, today we are on the verge of a new transformation of money. Today we are creating the world's first decentralized, global, and open form of money, right? We are moving from institution-backed money to network-backed money. Now, do you think everybody is going to welcome this? <laughs> Probably not. not, right? Again, I like to go back to history, right, and say the first person, he walks in with a gold depository note instead of a physical <laughs> gold. What did they say? They said, You're crazy. No, they said, This is not money, <laughs> right? Let's go back in time again where the person was trying to use credit cards to purchase goods and services. And what did they say? That's not money. When they discovered Bitcoin for the first time, they said, That's not money, isn't it? But now, digital assets are a force. And institutions, government, banks, they are coming on board. Let me give you a recent survey, right? A recent survey done of the top 200 family offices in the world, 77% of them have got at least limited exposure to cryptocurrencies, out of which 23% is actively looking to increase their exposure into the cryptocurrencies. So definitely governments, uh, banks, family offices, everybody's coming on board. It's only a matter of time. But Shailish, since you said, let's go back in time, let's go back a little bit in time and let's talk about FTX, <laughs> right? Now, you spoke about users, governments, institutions. Let's talk about how there's a thin line between trust right there. Now, maybe, what's your insights about this now? FTX kind of was one of the biggest exchanges and overnight, Boom. Say, boom. Transparency oh, is boom. gone, trust is gone. And I think most of the users, and hence the need for regulations, government bodies to be involved, they are afraid. So what are your thoughts? I mean, what are both of your thoughts on this? Mark, I would like to say one uh, sh short sentence and then sure, maybe sure, you should sure. take over, you know? Whenever money is concerned, bad actors will follow. Right? And that's what we have seen. So it's up to us as human beings to understand what are the dangers, you know, what are the red flags when it comes to investments. And I will go through some of them after Mark. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, well, in 2015, uh, Carnify was the key founder of a uh, regulatory body, uh, a lobby company or a lobby body that was um, supposed to help the government in the EU to shape the future regulation for, for blockchain. And in the Anti-Money Laundry Directory 5, we actually have put in a lot of the new ways of how to regulate cryptocurrencies, blockchain-based payments. And in the new uh, uh, Mika, there will also be a lot of different amendments from that we have actually been able to make. So we are super proud that we are, we are, we are shaping the future regulation of this specific phenomena or technology, right? That said, you have a lot of different application on top of this supposedly unhackable blockchain, right? Which makes people very confused because everybody says it's super secure, it cannot be hacked, everything is clean and kosher. And what happens, you see one company after the other uh, going belly up and then everybody's pointing and say you see blockchain doesn't really work the, the thing is that the, the applications the companies on top even though there is the first lines of regulation they are still under regulated 
And when it's under-regulated and run by, sorry to say, but a lot of teenagers, I actually feel very old right now saying that, <laughs> but, and also getting millions of millions of dollars from the classic VCs, then you have a problem. So I think Sam um, Friedman, FTX, and you know, the whole thing is still based on you can say that they have not done their job right, and they haven't, but we also have a lot of regulatory classic venture companies giving them all the money in the world without doing due diligence. So we obviously have, one thing is the regulation. I think we're actually quite far. Another thing is that there is no due diligence on these companies if they are driving a control business where they have no arm's length issues and all that. And that's the problem. And I think we should also point at all the VCs funding these companies with young people getting millions of monies, living in Bahamas, and just being able to do whatever right. they do. But because then it has to go wrong. You, you could regulate the industry, but is it possible to regulate how VCs invest their money? And that's an issue because when you see all these things happening at the moment, you want to over-regulate. And if we over-regulate this phenomenon, you could kill the whole technology. But I'm still so very the philosophy firm. behind the technology. Yeah, and then you don't have any innovation. Uh, but you could you could build sandboxes where you can play around before you deploy it in the real world, like you do in normal fintech uh, businesses. But I think I'm more into let's regulate this even stronger, and let's have even more even regulation on the people who receive money and for people doing the proper due diligence because that's the big lag, right? But of course, I don't want to over-regulate this. Um, but I'm not one of them who says, we, we cannot regulate this because then you kill all innovation. Because obviously, we are not grown up enough to build application and build proper business on top of it. At least not at the moment, right? Yeah, that's kind of my position. Perhaps not killing innovation, but crypto is about decentralization, freedom, getting away from government. And after FTX, we are calling government back in. So, what are we doing here? Are we doing something that is outside of, of the government area? Or do we need to accept that some sort of government is needed? I completely agree, right? But we've got to look at what are the challenges for regulators as well, right? Uh, in this space, innovation is so fast. Every day we have a new technology being invented with this DeFi, with this metaverse, there's new terms every day. Right? So uh, let's, just, let's take an example of a crypto exchange. A crypto exchange is no longer a crypto exchange. In addition just to trade cryptocurrencies, you have opportunities for staking, you have opportunities for borrowing, for lending, for futures. So which regulatory body does this come under? Right? And we do not have a common ground worldwide where all the governments are sitting together and putting down a, a, a general uh, worldwide crypto regulation. But it's really, really challenging because every government have got their rules and regulations, you know. So these are the challenges the regulators face as well. And uh, I completely agree with Mark. It definitely needs more regulation, but the innovation is so fast, they're playing catch up. And you, that's all they You haven't even regulated the internet yet. <laughs> it's Absolutely. Still difficult. So, so, so what I'm reading out of this is that a future FTX is inevitable. Like I said before, when there's money involved, there will always be bad plays. But what can we do? Right? You As mentioned the red flags. Exactly. Let's look at the red flags, right? And the bubble. Example. Exactly. Yeah. The bubble. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and if you can see what are the common red flags. Let's go through this. So, you know, this is useful for everybody here. Right? For example, one of them is when they are providing you, when somebody's providing you unrealistic returns. We have seen this all. Invest with us, we give you 10 times your yeah, return. Exactly. Define unrealistic. What is unrealistic returns for the crypto world? Because for traditional finance, you know that, for example, 5% well, a year is standard. Above that, then you, you start doubting. But perhaps in the crypto world, we've seen 10x. We've seen 15x. I've seen 2000x. That was last month in Dubai. Yeah. Yeah, you are right, uh, but, but uh, yeah, so it's also about educating people, right? And in Denmark, you have a lot of, the, I think it's a classic scam all over the world, but you have some common um, actors 
on the, on Facebook saying <laughs> I earned a lot of money yeah. and you just put some money here and then people are starting throwing money after them, which is completely stupid, right? <laughs> so we also need to educate people a little bit. Don't, under, but it is don't underestimate the stupidity of people. <laughs> yeah, but we're all chasing gold uh, in the end of the rainbow, right? Uh, and you are right, there is actually true stories about people doing 10, 100, 1,000 eggs. So, so then it's become difficult not to believe in these fairy tales, right? But I still believe that one thing is the regulation of how to do your business on a regulatory format. Another thing is that if anyone wants to put money into your business, you need to do proper due diligence. And I don't understand how these big companies put so much money into Three Arrow, uh, Alameda and FTX and so forth, also run by people in the early 20s, right? And no one have asked all the right questions. We managed to sell our business to a stock exchange company last year. We did all the spot checks, we did all the, they did due diligence with 25 lawyers and everything was checked in our business. How is our policies and how do we do this? Did spot check, all that good stuff and all our guidelines uh, on how to do stuff. And somehow these companies have just received so much money by normal authorities without checking if they've done their business right. But you also see it in the, in the normal financial world, if some of you recall the wire bank, who also uh, somehow did, uh, had no money on their balance sheet, even though everybody believed it was a, a billion dollar business, right? So these things happen, of course. And I would say that they have learned their lesson and probably learned the lesson well. Hopefully, hopefully. And yeah, I, I do see what you're talking about. So tell me what's next? I mean, uh, what is next? What's happening? What is the, the next step for Quinify? What is the next step for Masari? What is your vision in terms of the short term vision? What do you aim to do uh, within the region or say globally? Just trying to understand some of the mindset. Uh, in our opinion, um, we still believe that the Web3 and the metaverses will happen. Uh, I hope not that we are all sitting in small, uh, uh, <laughs> sitting at home and, and, and doing a mall shopping in a virtual space all day long. Uh, but I still believe that Metaverses is here. I have a kid in 12 years old and he's already in Metaverses, Roblox and all yeah. that good stuff, uh, spending money up there. So for them it's already happening. And we believe that there is still a it is, you know, blockchain-based payments in the metaverses will happen. And that's where Conify will be. We will become the strongest player when it comes to the future of payments. And the funny part is that, yes, you cannot buy online with your credit card, right? It's not gonna happen. You will pay with blockchain-based payments, but you will not even pay with your mobile phone that you do today scanning a QR code. That's what's happening when you're doing a checkout in, 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 a, in a merchant. Uh, at a merchant somewhere or in a shop. So we're also trying to figure out how will your avatar paying in a metaverse? Because somehow you need to interact with your crypto wallet, with your tokens or whatever it is, and accept that your avatar or something out there in the metaverse is making a transaction. And that's gonna be quite interesting to, to do some R&D in what, how it's gonna be to pay with even cryptocurrencies in a metaverse, because it, sh it cannot be as it is today. Right, like an avatar of your credit card, something like that. Yeah, I'm actually it's curious crazy. about this, to learn about this as well. I mean, exactly how to adopt a payment mechanism in the metaverse, where users are interacting. And most metaverses, they have this, uh, obviously, they want to pursue or they want to promote their own tokens. Mm. There's, uh, I, I mean, I, I know you're not, not uh, the metaverse ecosystem expert, but just in terms of payment, in short, if I'm a user in the metaverse and I want to use different currencies in the metaverse without ever leaving the metaverse, how do I do it? How do I pay? And that's the thing, and we're doing a lot of R&D in this, but I think it's going to be eye tracking and it's going to be that you can even with your eye, uh, you know, how you look, you can navigate and you can, you know, you can scroll down and you can choose your token or you are in a preferred metaverse where there's only one token allowed to be used in, mm -hmm. in, in, in game, you know, yeah, in some kind of an in-game token of some kind. And, um, and we are still talking about how it will happen, but, uh, but ideally it should happen without using your hands. And I think it's going to be a heaven, you know, in some extent. I completely agree. I mean, in my point of view, right, if I could put a, a 
an AI layer for my glasses. I wouldn't use my mobile or my laptop anymore. Sensor, okay. sensor, sensor. Shape. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There you go, yeah. So as I was saying earlier, if I could put an AI layer on my glasses, right, I would not be using my phone or my laptop anymore. That's why we wear glasses, both of us, because we <laughs> yeah. already have that layer. Yeah, we have the AI layer, absolutely. <laughs> we already scanning Thanks everything. for giving it out. But, <laughs> <laughs> but coming to your question, Hamza, in this region, right, asking for us, for Masari, Dubai is a home of tomorrow. Dubai is a home of innovation. And I would like to, first of all, congratulate the leaders and the citizens of the UAE for the successful launch of the rover mission, right? UAE stands to be the fourth country in the world to actually land on the moon. I mean, what an amazing achievement, right? So as you can see, we have always um, embraced innovation. We have embraced technology. And Masari is taking a measured approach uh, by helping these blockchain, uh, DLT, Web3 companies who are today shaping and adding to the GDP of Dubai. Totally agree, totally agree. I mean, Dubai is quickly becoming a hub. And uh, in terms of strategy, in terms of the regulations, um, I mean, even the metaverse strategy that was announced, it's just insane. And we see a lot of people coming into the region. Totally agree. Um, any further questions, Leo? Well, I'm thinking we're discussing the future and what other industries do you see blockchain affecting or what new problems do you see uh, taking this technology and adopting it and solving some problems that with the current technology uh, there's, there's no possible solution at the moment? So uh, now let me give you an example of where Dubai has led everybody uh, in this blockchain technology. So Dubai blockchain strategy was started by His Highness Sheikh Hamdan. And uh, the, uh, to give you some numbers, annually we can save 3.3 billion dirhams just by using blockchain technology for documentation alone. Right? So you see where the opportunity lies. And we all understand. But again, there are hurdles. Like, for example, I would say one of them are the regulatory. And Dubai is again in the forefront. We have regulations even for NFTs as well. You know, so that's one of the main challenges for this technology. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I've been um, part of founding a uh, blockchain fund where you can invest into that fund. And it only invests into blockchain or companies using the blockchain technology to spearhead themselves towards others in the industry. And I only did that to learn about how could blockchain really give unfair competitive advantages compared to, uh, to others in the same industry. And that is uh, healthcare, it is um, food tracking, uh, it is storing of secure data on the blockchain, and you can make different tiers of allowance of getting knowledge into that, meaning that I could have my whole health system on the blockchain, and then I can say, I'm in Dubai for the next seven days, now I want Dubai authorities to get full access to all my health data. So if something happens, they can even they can check in and see what I need, what my blood type is. Your all clinical that history on the Everything, blockchain. Everything. Yeah, the history can be on the blockchain, and I can allow different tiers of, of, of um, allowance of data in different time period or different regions. So that's also quite interesting. I've, I've seen companies really spearheading that. One of the biggest things, as I see, is the tokenization of assets. Again, we will be discussing that during this week also. Ah, okay, but, but, but you, have, you have a lot of um, illiquid assets like real estate that you cannot sell, but if you tokenize it, meaning that you can have a portfolio of real estates and you carve that into small tokens, then you can actually sell off parts of real estate portfolio. And um, there is a company uh, who is huge in this right now, making huge success compared to other real estate companies. And the biggest portfolio companies in the world are actually investing billions into this company because their technology has allowed them to tokenize their can, assets. Can we know who that company is? Uh, it's called... Um, Have you done your due diligence on them? <laughs> in this particular state... Are they teenagers? <laughs> We are investing in, in funds who is investing into these companies. And it's called uh, Almeida um, 
properties, I think. Uh, I can't recall the full name, but I think it is that. But I will get back to you on that one. <laughs> but that is definitely something that we see as, a, as an exciting world. And then the whole food tracking as well, that you could actually scan a package of meat and you can see where it comes from, how does the animal live, and all that good stuff. And it's all secured on the blockchain. And believe it or not, but the blockchain doesn't lie. If it's on the blockchain, <laughs> it's recorded, you cannot manipulate with that. Totally agree. So that's also a way of using the blockchain completely off cryptocurrencies and right. you know, all that good stuff, simply using the technology in different industries. Absolutely. So blockchain is a platform of trust, right? Currency is a first application. There's so many other applications in different, different industries, like Mark said, in the supply chain, in the banking. You could have this in the tourism industry, Wherever it's heavy documentation needed, because you know trust security is inbuilt into blockchain, so it can serve so many different industries. It's, it's a trustless system. That's the main one of the main you know pillars of it. And transparent and yeah. transparent. I mean, I, me personally, I think it uh, not only in the industries that you mentioned, but eventually in the next five to ten years, all the industries across the globe will be adopting this technology. Yeah. You also see combination of AI and blockchain right now yeah. in, uh, in document handling where it can help you to build the perfect contract. Uh, there's a new company selling this to banks using AI and then they can store everything on the blockchain. So again, you will find out that blockchain combined with uh, 3D printing or AI or other big uh, groundbreaking technologies, suddenly you can build something very, very strong. So okay. these combination of technologies uh, is also quite interesting to, uh, to look at in the future. We've discussed throughout this, this morning mostly the positive side. Do you see any risks of this technology being adopted like mainstream? You were just talking a few minutes ago, I hope we are not uh, at home with the goggles and you know, being androids. That's something I, I kind of be, I'm, I'm kind of afraid of that. But, so do you see any risks of this into the future? Um, risk in terms of, uh, if you can explain the question. Yeah, as I was saying before, if, if we start becoming like uh, detached from the rest of humanity because we are all inside the metaverse and you know, that kind of stuff, or perhaps risks in terms of you know, some environmental risks. You, we all know that Bitcoin consumes a whole bunch of energy and there's a big discussion there. So, open question. And I think also we, we touched you know, on the points of trust Obviously, like we mentioned FTX, and we don't need to speak about those things all, uh, again, but the points that he, like you know, Leo is mentioning, obviously, like people are getting too engulfed in this technology. And, the, you know, we are old, uh, and you see the children, our children, we are afraid that how they would be living a digital life, totally a digital life, right? And. It's happening. I mean, I don't know how many people have seen the movie Ready Player One, right? Yeah, exactly. If you haven't, then please go check out the movie Ready Player One. And everything that I saw in that movie, somehow now, now that I think about it, it's almost coming to life. So, I mean, and it, as it happens so that a lot of people, they do want to live a digital life. They, they, they want to be influenced by the digital influencers, the young generation. So, any thoughts, any, like any risks you think? I mean, obviously, we, as, as parents, uh, we know, you know what are the risks involved for the children in terms of health and all that stuff, but anything else that comes to mind that can basically... Yeah, uh, I can comment on that. Uh, I've been f reflecting a lot on the whole concept of decentralized stuff. Everything has to be decentralized. And you have this DAO, which is a whole new movement of companies whose autonomous organizations completely run by people in a consensus-based world. And all these things are beautiful on paper. Mm -hmm. Democracy is beautiful on paper. We are part of uh, the MakerDAO Foundation, which is one of the biggest uh, of these autonomous organizations. But honestly, sometimes nothing happens because it's just a pe lot of people trolling <laughs> and everything has to be consensus-based. And, and sometimes it's not efficient. One thing is that, of completely align with, I don't want us and our kids and our kids' kids to be on front of a laptop 80% of the time. We need to go out in the woods and we need to experience the real world and not through goggles. I completely align with that. 
But the whole concept that we are working on right now with de-attachments from government and we, we can do our own, be your own bank, own your own money, uh, you know, governments are bad. It's also a mantra that it's a little bit dangerous because then you also have governments who say, listen, we need to control you. We cannot do this. And then they want to over control you because we want to not be controlled. So that will be two forces getting in two different directions, right? Uh, so, so that could be a problem. And then also in an efficiently sense, even in Denmark, we have a beautiful democracy and everything is like, yeah, we vote on everything and we all have an influence. But sometimes nothing happens because everything is like getting enough voters to get something. And then after four years, you have a new uh, leading government and then nothing happens again. <laughs> and when I lived in Dubai, I saw things and that was like 18 years ago, right? You were very young at that time, Hamza. <laughs> but I saw, I saw stuff happening very fast because sometimes you also need someone to say, listen, we have to do this. And then there's a top management, like a company, you have a top management and you go in one direction and you execute on it. If everybody needs to be asked and talked about in an organization, nothing happens, right? So I kind of like this new hipster, hippie mentality that we de-attach everything, decentralized and consensus-based uh, way of building stuff, but it can also be a flaw, in my opinion. Yeah. Right. I would like to add into what you said, you know, when we were children, when we, come back, when we came back from school, for us to de-stress, what did we do? We went outside, met with our friends, played football, isn't it? Today, the children come home. What do they do to de-stress? They Games. go online. TikTok. Video games. Isn't it? So that's their de-stress, right, where they talk to their friends. So we need to identify that and work towards that as well. Number two. Talking about DAOs, right? Thank you for bringing that up. Like, um, it's a popular misconception because it's based on mutual governance, right? And smart contract. It's a misconception by these founders that these don't have any judicial liabilities. And actually, they can have unlimited liabilities, such as financial liabilities, judicial liabilities. You know, they need to come under a regulatory umbrella. They need to understand that smart contracts and mutual governance does not protect them from regulations. They could be, you know, facing unlimited liabilities. This is very, very important for everybody to understand. Right. Thank you. I think we have a crowd that wants to ask questions. Shall we open the... Let's go ahead. Yeah. So anybody feels like I see some asking our faces. panel some questions? Right. Yeah. Uh, can we get him a mic? I think it's fine. <laughs> yeah. And probably just if you can just introduce yourself a little bit, so yeah. All right. Well, first of all, thank you. Um, my name is Jürgen, I'm CEO of RDQ. I'm gonna have the pleasure of talking on a panel on Wednesday. Mark, one question for you, as you mentioned the Coca-Cola token. I was wondering, what are the listing requirements or the requirements for individual tokens to be um, listed and to be traded on, on your platform, on your payment gateway? And the second thing is, how do you, ma how do you manage the different regulations? Um, you mentioned Mika, and um, I mean, in the end of the day, what we have seen now, even in the European Union, that we have each single state defines payment token somehow different. With Mika, this will um, change. Nevertheless, we are trading worldwide. So when it comes to Dubai, to the European Union, the States, Asia, wherever, um, there are always different definitions of payment token. And I was wondering how you guys manage this, this issue. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, first and foremost, we are spending a lot of time in vetting the tokens that we are allowing on our platform, both in payment and trading. 
you have a whole set of different requirements that need to be fulfilled, otherwise we cannot onboard, uh, onboard them. I think we are in our payment, we have like 15, 16 cryptocurrencies out of 3,000. Uh, so anyone who is uh, trying to be anonymous or we don't believe that this, uh, uh, the people behind it is something that is serious, we don't onboard uh, these tokens. Um, so, so we have a very strict rules on what we want to do. When it comes to the regulation, uh, you can say that in Coinify, our compliance team and our development team is the two biggest teams we have because we keep track on all the regulatory requirements in each and every country we are in. So either we have a uh, legal opinion from the local authorities that say that we can be there, or we have a license that we are living up to. Um, in uh, Once again, back in 15, 14, we, used a lot of time on saying that we were self-regulatory because nobody regula uh, was regulating our industry. So we did our own invention of how we want to regulate ourselves. We even did a, um, a international um, speech uh, in Deloitte, uh, especially because they find it so funny that we did that. <laughs> so every time we are in a black spot, we simply say, listen, what is banks doing in this particular uh, incident? And then we are adopting what they are doing. So we are playing like we were a traditional bank. We say to ourselves, we are a traditional bank, so how should we act? So every time there is a black spot, we just do that. And of course, we have a lot of countries where they don't have any opinion about it. And then we say, listen, okay, then we do it until somebody says we do not. And then we have some countries on the blacklist, like MasterCard Visa has a blacklist countries, we do the same, and the gray list. And then some countries we say, we don't want to do it, even though there's a whitelist country. So it's kind of also up to us to define what we want to do. Thank you for your question. Uh, is there anybody else? Got a shy crowd. <laughs> Hello, my name is uh, Yves Lamar. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, something called BTB. Um, I was wondering how many Merchant, do you have online more or less uh, online and um, uh, real merchant for the accept payment right now? Yeah, um, I think it, we cannot say the exact number, which is kind of funny to say, even though I just said that we are super, reg you know, we are regulated. But when we are working with a collector PSP, we only settle with the PSP, and they are settling with the variation of uh, of, of merchants. So we do full KYC on the PSP, and we know how they onboard, uh, or we do KYB on, on the payment service provider. And then they are doing the facilitating all the payments on behalf of merchants. So you can say in our PSP network, we are at least embracing more than half a million merchants um, globally. And uh, at least we do, uh, on a daily basis, a thousand of transactions on behalf of merchants, uh, on, on, on behalf of the PSP. And then we have these new merchants going directly to us, and I think we have more than 10,000 merchants. And that's per day? Yeah. Or, okay. And then we have more or less eight to 10 merchants a week signing up on our platform, but a lot of them are never going through the KYB. So they want to have our solution, and once we ask for ultimate beneficiary passports and, and we start the whole shebang of, of questions, they stop uh, the processing. But we see a lot of desire to get our service, but we also see that sometimes they believe the herb is too big or they don't want to give up the, the classic information that you need to right. give up in order to be part of our solution. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, guys. It was a difficult question. Come on, then. Anybody else? Well, if you don't have... Uh, I don't, sorry, maybe you can't hear me. Yes, you can. Um, if we have no more questions for that first session, we have a little break yeah. and then we come back. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Shalish. Thank you, everybody, for joining. We'll see you back here in 15 minutes. Yeah. Let's have some cupcakes.
ladies and gentlemen. We're going to start again, if you don't mind, and uh, take your seat. Thank you. So, and I'm waiting for the speakers, of course, and or to host. Yes, you are. <laughs> Well, thank you. I hope you had a good break. So shall I introduce you to the two next speakers? Navid Singh, CEO at uh, Enery Blockchain, and Fabrice Brassard, French, you can hear it, CEO at IC, who is also a military drone maker. And uh, well, you you will be. Uh, let's introduce yourself, okay? And uh, have fun. No, no. Hello. There we go. Hello. Yeah. Welcome, Naveen, Fabris. Please uh, introduce yourself so the audience can come to know what amazing things you guys do. Well, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm French, and um, we develop, uh, the name of the company is IC. Uh, we, we are a technology provider and data provider, so I'm going to explain the, the difference. Um, we do design and manufacture uh, heavy drones. Um, Dual, you know, we have a dual activity, uh, so we focus on sustainable development, and we have also a, you know, development in the field of uh, the military uh, industry. Um, so we, the company is a, a is a young startup. Uh, we actually uh, took over a company uh, in 2020 uh, that has uh, developed a state of the art, um, you know, um, drone. Um, appliance are airborne um, and they, they spent uh, more than 25 million in developing uh, those uh, heavy drones so they can fly over like uh, 20 hours um, we're talking about a payload of uh, uh, 250 kilograms um, and um, well due to the uh, dramatic event um, that uh, we face in Europe um, the military sector has uh, became a major um, field on our side. Thank you, Fabrice. Naveen, Naveen, please. Thank you, um, gentlemen. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Naveen. So uh, my roots are from India, but um, most of my life I lived in Switzerland, so I'm Swiss. Uh, the journey started, I was a professional athlete, and then from athletics it came to um, IT. i been long now in IT, in sectors of telecoms, health tech, and eventually then landed up in the blockchain space, the Web 3.0 space, and still a student, I'm mean, learning the space, because I think it's a really early, early days of uh, this industry. Uh, maybe a lot of people will disagree with me, but I think in the technological level, we are still very early, and glad to be here, so ready to be grilled by those two gentlemen. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. So. Fabrice, let me start with you. Why would we need drones? Why not stick to like traditional uh, man-driven planes or whatever? Well, that, that's a, a, a tough question. Um, there are many answers that we could um, bring here to, to the table. I, I think the first aspect is um, light airborne um, is probably the future of av aviation. and. Um, the fact that um, we may use uh, unmanned uh, vehicle um, aircraft is going to change the way uh, we approach, um, the way we um, analyze uh, data. Uh, so it's going to be increasingly, um, well, the number of applications are becoming increasingly uh, varied. And um, I believe that, um, you know, um, self-driving and autonomous uh, uh, airborne 
uh, will be a game changer uh, in the years to come. And wouldn't that leave a lot of pilots out of a job? Um, I think the, the challenge is, is ahead, you know. Um, we've seen, you know, drones, but uh, s small uh, aircraft, let's, pull, let's call it like this, uh, to be developed. Um, are we going to be able like, to you know, develop uh, big jumbos without any pilot? I believe it's going to take some time. Um, so I believe you know, just based on, on the application and the approach uh, that we currently you know, trying to um, develop. To take, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, so your, 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 your question is, uh, is, um, is a tough question because, you know, what we That's the job, here, to make the tough questions. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> so it's a tough one because uh, you could, you know, make the analysis, the, the uh, you know, you, you could uh, also look at, you know, cars and, and do we want to have autonomous cars at some point? Uh, probably, uh, but it's going to take uh, quite a long time before it happens. Uh, so. Um, I believe that drones are going to change a, a way of uh, living. Um, you, you, you can see already this with you know many of uh, you know many players like Amazon who wants to have the ability to deliver uh, mm -hmm. uh, products and goods um, in the backyard uh, of your home. Um, and I, I just believe that's just the beginning. Um, should we envision a different world? I think so. Yes. And how is any of this related to, or how is the, the aviation industry related to the blockchain technology? Um, well, um, you know, uh, when we, we, we're talking about drones, um, you know, um, safety is, is, is then a major concern. So, uh, data security uh, and integrity is the uh, utmost importance. Um, so blockchain here, uh, along with AI, for instance, um, through you know machine learning, um, are going to um, secure uh, the protocols and um, and and policies that will be put in place by uh, you know regulation and custom safety standards. Uh, so it's 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 a it's a major. Uh, you know, topic, and I believe that blockchain is, is going to be a major, well, will play a um, very uh, important role. Yes. Now that you mentioned AI, Naveen, what are your thoughts of integration in terms of using the AI technology with the drone technology, and what do you see like happening in the industry? I do understand, and I do believe that this is, the integration just has to be seamless. What are your thoughts on this? What do you see AI taking over? So, I think drone is a good example of AI, you know. It's, uh, it's actually, I mean, humans can fly the drones or they will be the pilots, but it could be done through artificial intelligence also. So, I think if you take a step back, if you see all the data which we churn and if you take the analytics out of the data and then feed it into the machine to learn from the, those, um, if we control it right, then it can do wonderful things. And I think it's going to be, it's not even started yet, the artificial intelligence part, and it's going to take over in all the, uh, from software to the hardware system. Um, it's coming. Um, do you have anything? You, we were mentioning, we were talking before about the, the idea, the, the misconception that the public may have about the blockchain being hacked. Could you please elaborate on that? Well, um, let's ask the, 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 the people who are present here. So how many of you guys, um, you must have read all the news, and I'm sure you all are somewhere or other related with the, with the blockchain or crypto. How many of you, please raise your hands, um, have read or heard or know that there has been hacks in the blockchain? <laughs> so yeah, like more than 50% present here. Um, so I just want to give my opinion on that. Um, there has been no public blockchain which has been hacked until now. It's always the bridges, 
It's always the side paths which are connected or the pathway between Web 2.0 to the blockchain side, which is always being hacked. But most of the media and normal people like us, we have been fed or we read that the blockchains were hacked. You mentioned a couple of concepts that perhaps need a bit more explanation. What is the bridge? What is Web 2? What is Web 3? <laughs> so, <laughs> just imagine that we don't know anything and <laughs> we probably don't. So you, you're asking a, a sportsman such a tough question. <laughs> I think there are many other people here who know. So, according to my understanding, I think whatever we do on the internet now with smartphones, um, everything, we are into the Web 2.0 world where um, there's the internet which is provided to us as a service and then there are different applications and softwares on, based on the internet through the hardware which come to us. Now our participation is just the part which we take care in the web 2.0, rest is all in the hands of big tech companies. Apple can remove an app tomorrow, you can't do anything. You know, Twitter can delete your account, you, uh, you are on actually the mercy of big tech companies. They take your data, WhatsApp, Telegram, it's all free of cost, so they give you free, we use it, I mean, not you, me also, I use it. And uh, the cost we pay is through our privacy or to our trends, which then again, they take the data out of you, they run the analytics, they feed it in the machine, the machine tells them, okay, send them uh, advertisement of this and this and this. So Web 2.0 is something which we are just a, a mute participant, uh, but we are not in control of anything. And then some very smart people said, okay, freedom is very important. We need to develop something which we call Web 3.0, where my participation in the internet or anything in which is connected to the internet, um, I should have all the rights of who shall I share the data, um, who nobody can hack me, nobody can block me, nobody can actually make me an outcast from one second to other, like these big tech companies. And that was the whole vision behind Web 3.0. Um, I think we are still at the infra level, very beginning of Web 3.0. We are mostly based on Web 2.0. And that's why you have a decentralized world where you have a blockchain. But if the blockchain is then connected through the bridge, which is again a centralized part through a server to a wallet, um, these are the vulnerable parts which get hacked. And then the message goes out that the blockchain has been hacked. So the Web 3.0 world is in the starting now and we are completely based on Web 2.0. It will take some time until, it, until unless it will be an independent Web 3.0. Uh, we need a lot of projects which provide infrastructure for that. We will need a lot of um, good brains which will start doing some things which they are also doing um, to make it completely independent from the existing Web 2.0. But what type of infrastructure? Like data, data infrastructure, physical infrastructure? Actually, everything. Um, let's say different servers. Now, old companies, everything is based out of servers. But if you um, take the start of the blockchain, then every computer can become a node. You don't need a server. Um, depends exactly if you want to do the mining, and then, then you need really um, hardcore servers. But that's one part which you then say, okay, we don't need a data center. We don't need a firewall. We don't need internet security. We have one block, uh, one laptop or a normal computer with good graphics that they can um, actually act as a node. Now you have thousands of these nodes who nobody knows, and they are, this is a peer-to-peer -peer network. Nobody can shut it down, nobody can control it. As long as one node is, is live, your whole data or the whole blockchain is live, and they can communicate with the thing. As long as you have your private key, you can actually retrieve your, uh, I mean, in the end, it's all data. What is, uh, what is a Bitcoin? It's just, just a key mm -hmm. and it's a data. So in the end, it all boils down to data, and that's why I mean, uh, that's why we were very much focused on the data part. Let me let me connect what you just said about the nodes and the network not being able to be shut down, with Fabrice's work in building military drones, and I'm picturing the movie Terminator. So <laughs> AI self-driven military vehicles, uh, technology becoming self-aware. Is that a possible future or is it just Hollywood? Well, I hope not. It's going to be that, I mean, 
um, I, I think you know we have to determine the boundaries um, and, and set you know um, protective policies uh, and regulations so that we don't cross you know uh, certain uh, level of um, <laughs> Ethical boundaries, let's say. Yes. Um, but perhaps, if, if, again, if AI becomes self-aware, there is no ethics in, in a machine, unless you can embed it in code. But can you do that? Well, um, that's a question for both of you. you I mean, so, look, I think the military drones, they should be centralized. They should be somebody <laughs> accountable to that, and somebody has to control them. You cannot put them decentralized because then they're going to go rogue and they're going to go anywhere because um, all of us has a kind of naughty thing in our ass. The Terminator <laughs> is possible. <laughs> and nobody knows when it pop, pops out. So I think the drone part, uh, they can use the power of blockchain, um, smart contract facility and other things to actually store their sensitive data, process the data. Because one good thing about blockchain is only somebody who has a private key can have the access to the data. If they lose it, it's not retrievable. A lot of people ask me that, what about if we put our sensitive data and the private key is lost? What is the remedy? There is no remedy. And they say, well, then it's not good. I say, well, you cannot have both ways. You know, If it, there is a remedy, then it could be hacked as well. Mm -hmm. So if you want it secure, then there is only one thing, that you have your public key and your private key. If your private key is lost, then nobody has access to that. And that's why it's secure. So I think they can use it through the power, the, the, the power of the blockchain with the security layer where nobody can actually mess up with their data. Um, so in some ways, it's, it's absolutely um, complementary to them. And the rest, I think the drone part should be centralized. Is that what you guys are thinking you know, from within the company, from the managerial point of view? Well, I, I, I think, um, you know, Naveen has, has, has a good point here. Um, from, you know, the military exchange that we have with some of the different, you know, supplier, subcontractors that we're working with, um, we, we have to set those uh, limits. Uh, uh, and, and, and what you have to, to you know, uh, remember is that we're talking about, you know, unmanned aircraft, but at the end of the day, uh, you have still uh, a pilot uh, that is uh, behind its, its screen at the moment uh, and uh, actually, you know, controlling, monitoring um, the airborne navigation and all the um, operation that are going to be conducted. So uh, we're not yet at that stage. Um, I believe that uh, most of the states have, a, you know, uh, a stake uh, in being ethic, uh, and, and they are. Um, this is what I can, I can you know, guarantee, uh, at least from, you know, the NATO uh, country, uh, you know, um, and yes, um, I, I, I think, you know, uh, you're totally right. Uh, blockchain is going to be, you know, um, a major contribution um, to uh, those um, systems. Um, we, we need a redundancy. We need uh, security. Uh, integrity uh, and, and the blockchain is uh, the way to uh, actually ensure that uh, we have all those uh, data security around us. I can, I can add an example to that. So we, um, as a layer one blockchain, focus on the data. We just tied up a few months back with a company which is uh, completely owned by Indian government and it's a company in defense sector. It's called Bell. as the biggest you, you must yeah. know about that. It's the biggest tech company in India. Um, we are the first blockchain to tie up with them. Um, I think they have a backlog of 200 something companies in the pipeline to to have agreement with them. You tie up with, with Bell, your valuation goes skyrockets overnight if you are a, a defense company. I mean, you, you, you must agree with that. And the one reason that they did with us is, um, again, they have a lot of systems, drones, they work with a lot of drones, um, military radar systems, Navy, and they want to take this sensitive data and they just want to have a foolproof, completely unhackable data and put it on the blockchain and put a value contract or a smart contract in place where they can actually define what kind of values from the data can be shared by who and what can be used by who. Now, because of the immut immutable nature of the blockchain, 
everything is in the locked and nobody can actually change what has been put in there. So they have a, a full record. It took us three months to actually explain them how it works because they, <laughs> they, it's again the difference between Web 2.0 and 3.0. But in the end, uh, they're actually in his, from, from his industry. So it's a good example that how they see the benefit of a blockchain, which actually we didn't thought that blockchain can be used in the defense sector or in the sector where um, you have different hardware appliances like radar, uh, drones. Uh, but in the end, everything churns the data, and data is something which is valuable. I, hello? Sorry. My question? Hello? Can you hear me? No, try this one. Hello? Yeah, it's okay now. Uh, my concern was in terms of exploiting exactly this. Now, usually if there's a human element involved, now, with drones, there is no human element involved, but it is still controlled by a centralized, say you're, you're suggesting that it be controlled by a centralized person or an entity. How can, I see a way of exploitation, and how can you avoid that? Because now you don't have a human element, and you mentioned, for example, what's happening in today's world. Now, there's a drone there, right, say going out into, I'm just going to say it, into the battlefield or in, into and with no human aspect. So in terms of the loss, you see, people get sentimental, oh, if something happened to the drone, mm, okay, but if something happened to the human element, it's a different story. Do you think this could be exploited or this could be enabling countries or to have a far more aggressive approach to, say, um, warfare or anything like that? I think wherever humans are involved, it's completely <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> so, sorry for my language. Um, wherever we have seen the, the examples where there's no intervention of humans, let's say Bitcoin as a blockchain, it's just working fine. And you have seen blockchains which they say it's public but they are still centralized and they are still run by a few humans and then they, they stop the blockchain and they run it again and all that thing. So I think as long as the technology is robust, and human intervention is less, I think there should be less risk. It's my personal opinion. Yeah, well, I, I, I totally agree with you. So, uh, um, you know, what, one of the aspects today is, um, because we're talking about, you know, wherefore, where, where um, is that uh, the major challenge is, uh, from the enemy perspective, is how can I eventually control those drones? So faulty, you know, um, aircraft navigation is becoming a major uh, challenge. And you, you, we, we're talking about, you know, com uh, inter you know communication interference, uh, jamming, and all that kind of stuff. So um, I totally agree. Um, you know, the perspective is, is really ugly when you really want to dig out a little bit more. Um, that's why, you know, on our side, uh, we don't only, or we're not only involved in the military sector. Um, and I, I'd like to be a bit more positive because <laughs> um, from that perspective, you know, when, we, when we're talking about sustainable development, for instance, uh, we, 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 we're currently trying to uh, develop a state-of-the-art uh, solution where we'd like to take all and, and fight against, you know, wildfires. And the approach is going to be totally different. Uh, we, we're facing, you know, um, mega wildfires, you know, everywhere uh, those years. And, 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 and the fact is that it's extremely difficult to fight uh, because we still have an empirical approach. Uh, so blockchain here is going to change a lot of things. Um, so we're going to bring, you know, some rationalities uh, that we didn't have, so we, we're gonna, you know, map uh, those forests uh, and um, develop, you know, uh, risk areas based on weather conditions uh, on a daily basis, and so develop patterns so that those drones can fly and detect early enough, you know, uh, any eventual uh, fire somewhere. Uh, that's one aspect. The second one 
Um, and I believe this is just to you know, express the uh, potential for AI, because I believe that when we're talking about drones, we have to be way beyond of just thinking, oh, it's just an unmanned, uh, you know, airborne. Um, you have to look at it as a um, aerial uh, observation platform that is, that is going to carry, you know, many, many sensors. And with those sensors, we are going to um, change the way we approach and analyze, you know, um, data. Um, I'm, I'm going to make a, a simple, you know, comparison with um, the, the way we, we, we work today. Um, we're using, you know, intensively satellites. So we have a, a picture at a given time. But with, you know, um, those platforms, we're going to be able, like, to collect and proceed data in real time. So that's why, you know, when we're talking about blockchain now, uh, you need redundancy. You need to have, you know, when you do machine learning, to have a decentralized uh, system where you can be sure that, you know, you can store data safely, uh, be able like, to track those drones at any time, uh, any, you know, any moment. So um, I believe that the potential, what I'm, I'm trying to emphasize here is that um, drones is just a, a tool, but what is really behind is, you know, um, artificial intelligence that is going to change everything. And, and that aspect, if, you know, and that's why, you know, light, uh, airborne uh, is going to be the future for aviation. It's because till right now, satellite were, you know, a way to collect those data um, very, from, you know, a, a very inexpensive way. Um, with the drones uh, that are very, um, you know, um, inexpensive, uh, and, and, and um, at, you know, at a cost, uh, operating cost that are substantially uh, lower than, you know, the one for satellites, I think, you know, the application are going to be uh, just amazing in the years to come. What about the commercial aspects in aviation? Now you have the traditional customer mindset, right? Say for example, if someone told me that this plane is being flown on AI, Right, and it's going to take me from one destination to the other. Now, the traditional generation, like my grandmother or my mom, if she comes to know it's been flown by nobody, they're not comfortable to get on the aircraft. Now, this is just a customer perception. And I do, un I do understand that what's happening now is a lot of... Um, the, the aviation and the industry is actually focusing on having unmanned aircrafts, taking over the commercial aspects. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I'm really curious to know. And where do you see the commercial airlines adopting 100% AI technology? And when I say, uh, you know, it automatically becomes a drone, right? Because it's unmanned. So, and yeah, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> I think a pragmatic approach is that I'll put my mother first in a driverless car <laughs> <laughs> and then she shows that it works, then I'm going to say, see, if the car works, then it will work in the a plane because there's no traffic up there. So. But um, You should hire him as your head of marketing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but do you see commercial airlines adopting this full on in the near future? Yes, I think... Um, so we humans have a tendency to copy, you know, if there are a few brave ones like you and me, if they sit in the plane and they start talking about it, we, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest assets we humans have is adaptability. We are very adaptive, you know, with the technology, with weather, with conditions, we adapt ourselves, we learn and we move on and that's why we are thriving as comparison to other species. So I think when it comes to this point, we will adapt it. That's, that's my thinking about it. Um, my, my, my point of view, uh is um, that, that, well, from a commercial perspective right now, it's, it's pretty difficult uh, to sell out those drones. Um, so you have uh, to segment uh, the market, and I'm gonna explain why. Uh, and it's due to the fact that we still talking, you know, about unmanned airborne. So um, difficult to integrate drones 
in air traffic uh, due to a multitude of reasons. One of them, of course, is the safety uh, concern. So that's why, you know, when we are watching movies most of the time, uh, we see like those big drones uh, making wars. Uh, we're reading, you know, in the news that drones may change uh, the approach that we may have in the years to come. But, um, you know, it's uh, from a civilian perspective, it's quite limited uh, due to the fact that uh, drones don't have the capacities or capabilities to detect and avoid over airborne. So because of that, um, the market is segmented. And, 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 and if you do have like small drones, uh, the VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing, um, I'm sure that you know that um, you need um, to use those drones in, in very specific areas. So to get back to your question, um, when you're using, you know, military drones, of course, like, it means that um, you have a purpose and um, you don't really care about the authorization uh, from, you know, any regulators, FAA or EZA. Um, they, you go there and, and you just launch your launch to do, you know, ISR uh, missions or uh, armed missions. Uh, but when, um, when it's, uh, you know, in, when, when your goal is to uh, use drones for um, the civilian uh, sector, it's much more complicated. And, and, and again, if we go back to blockchain, um, that, you know, blockchain should be able to help, you know, uh, their integration and reliability in air traffic management. Um, in conducting, you know, um, operation uh, that are sometimes critical in I, uh, you know, uh, traffic areas. So tomorrow, you know, the big, big challenge for drones is uh, to develop the capabilities that are n named, you know, see and avoid or sense and avoid. I don't know if you, if you heard about this, but once we're going to be able so typically to detect any uh, over aircraft in your environment and to get the proper response this is how you know artificial intelligence is going to be crucial here because you need to take you know decision very quickly and 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 both aircraft needs to take you know a coordinated uh response so that they don't uh you know Correct crash ass to each other so so yeah those so from a commercial standpoint and I'm gonna try to be uh, you know to make a long story short um, on our side for AV drones uh, we uh, consider that uh, the markets have developed extensively for the military areas at the moment um, most of you know all the players that are designing and manufacturing drones have a major issue, uh, it's how can I use that drone uh, in an urban a environment um, and, 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 you know, we, we need to provide, you know, reliable, you know, data uh, to the regulators so they can track and make sure that, you know, they can review uh, drone flight uh, data, for instance, all those kind of things so that the market can really be uh, developed. So it's, it's, it's going to be a long process, but faster than we think, I believe. Nabim, you. you were mentioning before that holding the private key or losing the private key is the difference between accessing your, your data or not. Let me give you a, a small personal history. After the FTX collapse, some friends of mine convinced me to move all my crypto out of exchanges into a cold wallet, a ledger. I go to the ledger, I start setting it up, I get my private key, and uh, you know, the ledger says, okay, now write this down in a piece of paper. Isn't that like going back in time to a period where technology doesn't exist? It's like, it feels kind of weird that we have all this technology, 
but in the end, it depends on some, some writing, some 12 words on a piece of paper. And if I lose that piece of paper, then I'm done. It's, it's kind of crazy. How, how beautiful it is. It's, it's stupid. <laughs> <no>? <laughs> And I personally know people who actually have these pieces of paper stored in a safe. Yeah, of course. I mean, that, that's been working so hard to, to make it happen. You should be thankful. <laughs> you know? The thing is, um, if well, I lose my private key and I lose my money, I will not be thanking anybody. Yes. So, internet is a is a whole world where everybody has a connectivity and everything which is connected with the, inter, uh, in the uh, internet um, has, a, has actually a disadvantage as well. Whereas your piece of paper is with you in your house. There is no way until unless break, somebody breaks in your house and just looks for that paper, which I think all of us now know that you have a piece of paper so you can try to... <laughs> uh, so it actually... Luckily I live very far away, so if you, if you want to break into my house, you need to at least get on a plane. Well, you know, the funny part is, let's say somebody breaks into your house and he looks on different valuable parts, you know, watches or cash, and so, no, no, I just want to have a piece of paper. So how important that piece of paper is. You're right, but unfortunately, you know, you have to take mm -hmm. things out of this, uh, this whole uh, cosmos system of internet. As long as they are in there, they are not safe. And that your, your private key is actually your access back to those funds which are now cryptographed and just been locked in the internet. And nobody has access to that. So the thing is, I know what you're saying. It should be one step ahead that we should have uh, some sort of solution which is in the internet, which is online. Uh, if you lose it, you can retrieve it. But then again, you know, there has to be boundaries somewhere. And the boundary is that you lose your private key, that's it. Because if you can retrieve your private key, then somebody else can also. Mm. You know, you're not, the, you're not the only one here. There are very smart guys <laughs> there who are just doing the whole day this thing will depend on that piece of paper for the rest of my life. That's what you're saying. Make sure you have a lot of copies. But the, they, <laughs> ad, they advise against that. Make one copy, that's it. Because if you have many copies, then somebody can steal you your just copy. Just write it in your email and send it the email to me. In case you <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, as the industry uh, evolves, there, were, there would probably be more smart and solutions to uh, store your, you know, keys. I personally just put it in my secure folder, right? And that's what I do personally. So just a suggestion Thank for you. you. You know, um, <laughs> uh, we have a, well, our legal advisor, he's one of the very earliest crypto lawyers. And he was supposed to be here, he's not here. So he, he had also on the ledger, his funds, and he actually um, downloaded the application from Microsoft because he had a laptop with the Windows, and the application was on the Microsoft Cloud uh, with the same thing like Ledger. He put his private key in there. It just happened a month ago, and that was a, actually um, a fishy uh, application, and that was the only Ledger application on the, on the Microsoft platform. So he actually got hacked, even it was on Ledger, just, just to give you an example. You know, Leo, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, you have just revealed where your private key is, and I'm sitting here, I've revealed <laughs> where my private key is, and I see all these people. <laughs> you have a very right. generous to Somebody a, Someone from there is going to have a good time soon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to go back to something we, we touched a bit before. You were saying, both of you were saying that you, your idea of security is getting humanity or the, the human aspect out of it as, as much as possible. But if we do that, aren't we losing f our freedom? Freedom to decide or whatever? See, the, human, the human aspect is not getting out of it because in the end the blockchain is run by humans as well. It's just a, um, a random humans who are not together and when these humans are not together they don't have the same motivation. Instead of giving our data or our power or, or, or the whole thing to a centralized, what is a centralized part? It's like few, like we four individuals. 
if we control a blockchain, then it's a centralized blockchain. It's a private blockchain. It's not a public blockchain. We are four nodes, and we can actually go rogue. So we can actually uh, manipulate everything. So the beauty of the blockchain was as long as there are uh, even a small group of nodes who are not uh, um, um, acting in a rogue way, uh, the blockchain would be absolutely transparent. So it's still the human aspect is there very much. It cannot be run without, but it's all the humans which are not connected to each other and they are not having one agenda to actually exploit as much as they can other people's money or funds or anything. So it's still very human, but distributed way. And is there any disadvantage from that decentralization? Well, I'm a soldier of decentralization. How can <laughs> I tell you that? I mean, the disadvantage, one thing which we, which we talked about now is, for example, the private key part. There are still limitations of the decentralization part. There's a disadvantage that the whole decentralized campaign is still based on our um, old school internet web 2.0 thing. So we are still in a very early stage or very early days of this part. And I think the next five years are very interesting when you can really see a revolution of decentralization where there will be complete decentralization, which is not based, which will not be based on the web 2.0 centralized part. In terms of privacy, now big data is a big thing, right? Do you think Privacy is something of a key risk or issue here? Like in terms, like you see users now, for example, if they are, say, on, in a metaverse or they're on blockchain, now there's, you know, um, what now metaverses are talking about is how they leverage the information based on NFTs, blockchain, and they take the user habits and they advertise to the user. And one of the things that people were talking about, now I know it's a bit different from the traditional uh, industry that you're in, but say for example that you are taking this information, it's, an, it's on the metaverse, and I need to say for example get something delivered, I buy something um, like a dress, and I take this information, take it out of, you know, I put this on blockchain, and put it on a website where the, say, a brand is actually getting this information, right, to ship that dress to you. In, in a way, it's, it's data. It's being shared, but on two different parallel platforms. One is secure, blockchain, one is not. What do you, like, is there any suggestion, is there any way that we could actually avoid this? Like, decentralized means, in, in a lot of ways, anonymous information, right? Do you think, in terms of making specific decisions for brands, for businesses, you do need a little bit of information about the consumer personally. So, See, it's what I have explained before. A centralized world is the world which is focused on the big tech, on the, on the big giants or the corporations. They actually um, own your data and they uh, use the data. I will not say they misuse it, but they use the data the way they want to use. Now, this anonymous world of decentralization, which you have said, is the user with its private key is the owner of the data. Now a user can actually, so all of us, we have a lot of data and we can actually decide which data is sensitive and which is not sensitive. I think all of us have data which we would not like to share with anyone. And all of us have data which we share with our friends, with our family, with this and that, and with our um, work colleagues, with our company. But this decision of what kind of data has to be shared with who, what is absolute private and what is just normal and what is just public, uh, should be in the hands of an uh, individual, not in the hands of the big giants. And that's where the blockchain or the decentralization part comes. You, as an end user, can decide how do you want to use your data, who you want to share your data with, and what kind of data you want to share it with. And no one else has access to data as long as um, you don't want it. And that has never been done before. Now, your data on the Twitter or whatever you do on the internet or Google, or what, you have absolutely no right or no say well, how they use the data or what they do with your data. You cannot even control it. They can shut you off, they can block you, they can delete your account. That's it, you're gone. And that is what the whole Web 3.0 revolution is about, that they can't do it. They cannot stop it, they cannot manipulate it. Your data belongs to you, your participation of internet belongs to you. Um, there should be, again, that is a, again a, a question of 
how would you check that? What kind of regulations would be that? Will people who will misuse this freedom, of course they will misuse it, but first, it's always like that. A new technology comes as disrupts things, and then slowly the self-regulations come in. I mean, before when I came, you gentlemen were talking with somebody and he said, we were very early in 2014 and then we started self-regulating ourselves. Uh, so this will happen because the, if you don't self-regulate, then somewhere you will be out of the space because everybody will shun you down saying that you are non-ethical. So the ethics actually bring self-regulatory, but I think we should absolutely start with the fully decentralized part where you are the owner of your own data and then slowly, slowly the trends will come and then big techs will come approach you and say, hey, maybe we want to pay you or maybe we want to do a barter system that you give your data to us and we actually, in exchange, provide you some services. That's going to happen. Or some cryptos. <laughs> or some cryptos, yeah. So that's going to happen. But the first thing is that we actually have an infrastructure where we can say, yes, we are completely uh, uh, not based on the big te tech and we are not relying on them. We have our own cloud, our own, own bubble, which we um, completely control. So that is the first start. I mean, the first step to start this. Perfect. So t what's next? I mean, what's next for the NRE group? And you know, you, what's, what's the, like, your next step in the region? What are your plans? And what do you intend to do? And then like your short-term goals, just to get the audience to get a perspective on an idea. So we as a as Inery blockchain, we have uh, launched our public testnet round two months ago and um, it exceeded all our expectations and is actually uh, make a new record in the blockchain um, space that there were more than 2,400 master nodes registered to test our blockchain on the testnet. The number we thought was maybe 200 and it went above 2,000 which is more than many of the very successful layer one blockchains mainnet. Um, so having this kind of technical um, feedback and enthusiasm gives us a lot of boost. So we will be launching our mainnet in next quarter and then the first ever decentralized database. So any application which is out there can use a decentralized DB. Uh, even you can make a website in the back and you can use the blockchain. So this is something which has never been done before. That should be coming in the next quarter. Then a few other listings on some exchanges and a lot of use cases with B2B, as I mentioned, like Bell and uh, many other government institutions, which I will not name, which we are in the pipeline now to, to close. So we are pushing really hard the, the adoption of blockchain technology in various sectors. Thank you. Well, on, on our side, um, I think um, we are in a ramping up uh, process where we want to uh, install, you know, different facilities. Um, well, one in the U.S., um, one eventually in the U.A. And as you can imagine, uh, you know, this is what I, I was mentioning at the beginning uh, um, of the event. Um, we're not only a technology provider, we want to become a data provider. And, and so we really in trying to develop a uh, disruptive uh, turnkey solution for the end user where we definitely want to integrate uh, blockchain uh, systems. Um, so that we can definitely expand our capabilities to analyze, you know, uh, certain uh, situations. Uh, so I, I believe that's the beginning, and uh, we have many, many uh, big players. But we we really, you know, trying to uh, develop uh, state of the art solution. So we were talking about uh, see and avoid. Um, we're currently developing one of uh, the most advanced uh, solution in that uh, area. Uh, we, we're working uh, with you know, uh, many you know, universities uh, among the world with open sources for uh, developing also um, a, you know, a solution for wildfires, I mean, firefighting. Um, um, and so there are plenty of, of, of stuff that we wanted to do. Um, but again, um, we believe that and we hope, um, I think, you know, we, if I can make just a small comparison with, with Apple, if you do remember, uh, Apple was a um, hardware uh, provider. And, um, and, and just, you know, when you think about uh, 2000, that was, you know, yesterday, 2018, uh, Apple uh, revenues was 60% uh, 
based on its hardware. Uh, as of today, uh, hardware represents less than 20%. So it's a data provider. And, and I think, you know, when you're talking about data, and, and I, I'm listening carefully, you know, Nevin, and, and I'm, I'm totally agree with uh, what, you, what you mentioned, uh, blockchain is going to change uh, the approach that we're having. Uh, uh, it's entirely decentralized. It's, it's, it can bring, you know, uh, the security uh, redundancy that it, we need uh, for uh, drones. <laughs> um, you were talking about, you know, freedom, privacy. It's a major concern when you're developing drones. There are uh, flight violation uh, in areas where you need to make sure that uh, you're fully complying with, you know, uh, the. Um, protocols uh, set by regulations and, and custom uh, safety standards. So a lot of, you know, going on and, and we hope that at some point we will become a, a major player on that market as well. Thank you. Thank you, Fabrice. Thank you, Naveen. Uh, we will now open questions, unless you have anything to add. We can open the mic to the um, public, yes. We can now uh, open questions for the audience. So please. I see a difficult question coming, yeah? Hello. Uh, I'm if you can just quickly introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm because I'm a software engineer. Okay. So, um, can you imagine a future where people running blockchain nodes that you depend on somehow lose their incentive to do so, and how do you guarantee the future security of your chains? So you just introduced, you, you're a software engineer. Yes. Well, buddy, I cannot guarantee it if you ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you then guarantee your investors that whatever you're building is going to remain secure? Look, we guarantee our investors what we are building is um, actually fulfilling what we are saying its purpose is. But we cannot guarantee human natures, can we? We cannot say that a software engineers like you would stop tomorrow using blockchain technology. If they, if they stop it, they will stop it. I, mean, I would not lie to you and say, of course we guarantee that. We cannot. I mean, and regarding this security, because you said blockchains cannot be hacked for as long as they're decentralized, right? This, my question was aiming at, you know, the problem of how do you guarantee decentralization then? But also, you have the smart contracts, which themselves could be exploited, could be mistakes in them. So how do you secure that, right? Because even though the blockchain cannot be hacked, if you write your faulty smart contract, it can be exploited. So do you have audits? How do you, how do you handle this as a, as a company that starts the chains? Because I believe that's what you're doing, right? So this is a very, very good um, or question or, or observation which you have said. I would, say, I would say that I'm saying again, I mean, if it's a public blockchain, and I said it before also, if it's a public blockchain and it has considerable number of nodes and the validation and the consensus mechanism is right, it cannot be hacked because you cannot, it's immutable, you cannot go in the blockchain and change the blocks which have been done. Smart contracts are um, a smaller part of the blockchain which happens for the execution of the things which you do in blockchain. They can be hacked and they have been hacked in the past and what we can do is actually hire smart guys like you and companies who can audit the smart contracts and it has been happened that there have been smart contracts audited by top companies, I will not name it, but there was still some kind of human error and guys like you exploited it. Yeah, I've paid a lot of money for auditors and uh, <laughs> I've had the same pain. Yes. So uh, also, um, sorry, Fabrice, no, it's okay. I have a question regarding uh, what you want to do with the blockchain because right so far the cost of block space is too high to store real data and we seem to only be storing relatively small numbers or short texts like URLs, do you expect that there will be a move where we put real data in the blockchain as well? And is that what you're doing? Or are you only putting references and short text like I just said? Well, I, <clears throat> I think I was referring to uh, cyber security concerns. Um, when you're talking about, you know, drones um, and the environment that is around is, um, how can we store data? Uh, safely, how can we track, uh, you know, your drone? Um, so my, 
maybe a, a yeah you're storing so you're storing real data like i have a map of uh, ukraine and i'm storing the entire map on the blockchain <laughs> um i'm not involved you know in in that area well i, I believe some probably do um on my side we haven't developed any anything at the moment uh uh in, in that perspective uh I'm, I, I would jump in and, and help Fabrice with it. I yes. think putting the whole data on blockchain, it's still not possible because you're right with that. But if you use micro and metadata, you can actually put a lot of data on blockchain and still per serve the purpose. So where, where you have uh, basically an incomplete data, but you can verify, that's what you're talking about? Like no, I'm talking about micro and metadata. So if you use metadata, most of your files, um, it's, a, it's a core data. And it actually, you can put in one megabit, maybe like five to 600 files. But if you use full data, which you're saying, uh, full comprehensive data, then we have a scalability problem in that. Exactly. So the solution is, which our blockchain used was use micro and metadata. So we can actually address the scalability issues. Oh, okay. One more question. <laughs> ah, shit. Well, I actually only had one more um, because I enjoyed your conversation about uh, the private key and where you store it. By the way, oh. never store it on a computer that's connected to the internet. That's why you have a ledger. It's that's not, his problem. It should not be connected. Mine is some paper. The paper is better, way better. <laughs> anyway, uh, so and I was thinking, do your companies work with uh, multi-signature, uh, multi-signature solutions, multi-sig, to you know get two out of the three keys required to make a transfer, stuff like this? And that way, help your users to be more secure because one of the keys could be in your control, two of them on theirs. If they lose one of them, you can help them out with a help desk. Like you get a bit more of the Web 2.0 experience with multi-sig. And if people lose one key, they're still safe. Is that something you're working with? Is that something yes. you're looking at? Yes. So that's something you can do with our smart contract, which we call a value contract. And you can define that in the value contract. Perfect. Wait, Thank uh, you. what was your good name again? Lucas. Thank you very much for the questions. Run of, guys, you have to give a round of applause because <laughs> those were some good questions right there, right? There were some good questions. He's a good listener. Yeah, it's a good question. The whole time he was on the computer just writing. He said, okay, he said this, let me write that. Those are the questions actually we look forward to and this enables other people to learn as well. So after having that, is, an, is there anybody else? Yeah, yeah. Hi, my name is, my name is Richard. I'm a, a co-founder of Vernissage, which is a um, community for Web3 community. I have a question about your, I think Hamza, you attempted to ask the question, but I don't think you got a full answer. Uh, when you're in Metaverse, or we're talking about decentralization, keeping your privacy, um, anonymity, and so on, so on, so and then you moved on to uh, delivering things. So there must be, and there will be, somewhere, a borderline between living in your decentralized space and living in your home where you order something in Metaverse but has to be delivered to your address. So delivery guy needs to know your name, address, phone number probably and everything. Um, so I don't think we would be, probably we would be lying to ourselves that everything will be decentralized. It possibly cannot be. You cannot live in your house that is decentralized. <laughs> so how do you guys go about it? I mean, do you see or do you foresee some kind of fence where you dis decentralization exists and suddenly where normal life begins. There, there must be some kind of borderline then. How do you see that? Well, I think, I, think, I mean, the, the border is, exists very much at the moment and if you geographically divide it, I think 99% is all centralized and there is still, I think, 0.5% decentralized space which is kind of like popping up like a mushroom and now taking over more and more space. There will be always borders, but I think there will be bridges. So you can actually um, transfer from one to other, but they are two completely different worlds. And if you say one will exist, other won't, I don't think so. I think both will exist. Now, how much harmony they both have, that's a question of the future. If I may add, I think it would be more of a complementing each other. Yeah, in certain aspects, like decentralized you know, services can actually solve a lot of problems. I, I don't know if you guys saw recently, Kanye West lost a lot of money because Adidas blocked his accounts, right? <laughs> and he comes and says, Bitcoin. So I'm just giving, this is, for example, you know, when people want to have control over their money, 
uh, blockchain in terms of security, uh, infrastructure, and then obviously you have the real life, right? So yeah, we will definitely see a clear uh, thin line between the two uh, centralized and decentralization, but I think in terms of adoption is going to take time. And this is what exactly what we are trying to do, you know, uh, give some knowledge to the consumers, people like you, uh, people like the gentleman right there, and of course, uh, you know, our key speakers. So the idea is to address these concerns, have a, like a cohesive mindset on how we can address these concerns. So thank you very much. Just one more thing, uh, not about decentralization. You mentioned about flying a plane without a pilot. Uh, if you think that's ever going to happen, potentially might, but you're already flying and landing the plane without pilot intervenience. So you probably don't even aware of that. Uh, in many, I'm from the aviation industry, so I'm, I'm well aware. <laughs> I, used to, I, used to, I, I used to work in air traffic control and, uh, <laughs> uh, many years ago, not recently, no. and uh, they already, I'm talking about late 90s, uh, late 80s, already system were existing where Jumbo can land at the airport and pilot would, could be asleep. Um, so I can imagine how things have moved since then. So we are flying flights, planes now where pilots not doing much actually. So That's true actually. Yeah. Yeah. They just, it comes in a matter of trust where you have two now, now you have three. You know, you have two uh, pilots and an you know, air officer sitting right behind. It's a matter of trust, I would say, just to make sure that there's no error, because the safety is imperative. To give your grandmother reassurance. To give my yeah. grandmother reassurance. It, it, it was actually about his grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> he was not concerned. The whole industry is based on Hamza's grandmother. But you're right, you're right. I mean, but how do we take this element out completely is the question. Where, I mean, look at, in the future, airlines might be able to actually save a lot of money, let's be honest, you know, when you don't have two pilots and an air officer sitting down there. Just imagine the, the, the phasing in, phasing out uh, non kind of pilot planes with air traffic control, where air traffic control and no exactly. everything was happening, and suddenly a drone pops up and uh, does its own things. I think the phasing, the, the transition will be very long. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Very difficult as well. Yeah. yeah. Very difficult. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you for the questions, guys, and really appreciate it. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you, Fabrice. And thank you, everybody. So my pleasure to announce now the lunchtime. So for the VIP and speakers, we, when you go out of the auditorium, you go on the right. And uh, for people who attend the event,
Welcome back. I hope you had a good time and a good lunch. So we are going ahead with a, with a master class. Um, the first part will be with Navin Singh, CEO at Inary Blockchain. Welcome back again. And uh, it's about decentralized data infrastructure. So enjoy. Thank you. get started. Can you hear me right? There we go. So we're going to start this first master class. The way we're going to approach this is Nabim and I are going to have a, a short interview, a couple of questions, but then it's mostly your moment to take advantage of having this great guy over here and, and loading all your questions onto him and making his life a bit difficult for the next hour and a half. So let's let's get started. Navim. Oh, uh, you want to try this one? Is that one working? Yeah. On your area. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. Now it's yeah it's working. All right. Sorry, technical things, you know, <laughs> it needs time. We need adaptation. <laughs> Come slowly. So hello, everyone, again. Um, I think a lot of new faces, the guys who were before here, they left. They had enough of us. So. <laughs> um, my name is Naveen, and I'm representing um, our company, which is a layer one blockchain called Einry, which is one of the few blockchains which is specifically focusing on the data management part. So we just are focused on the problems which we have in the space of data. And we will be here talking about that and I'll be um, delighted to answer your questions at the best of my capabilities, whatever I could. So let's start. Yeah? Let's start. So why proximity data centers and not centralized servers? Well, everything now is centralized servers, and everybody, everything, all these centralized servers are now in the data centers. Um, they are working fine. They are giving us a lot of speed. The problem is all the hacks, the security. There are two major issues. The first issue is security, and I think none of us wants to have our private data to be compromised. I mean, I'm sure you have your private <laughs> data, which you told before, your, your private keys. In a piece of paper. Yes. yes, you don't want to be them in the server and you don't want to be them get hacked. And then um, it's your financial assets, but there is other kind of data like medical data. There is other kind of um, data, which is your private data, even if it's your private photographs, um, which you should have the right to decide who you share with. So the problem with the data centers and the servers are, when it comes to the privacy and the security of the data, they are not doing the job at the scale they should do. They are around 40 to 65% hacks in centralized servers. Wow. And the reason is because there's one IP address and the hackers, they don't have to work very hard to get hold of that. And once you are in there, it doesn't matter how much firewall, cyber security and things you do, once you are in there, you are in there, and then you have the full, I mean, as a hacker, you have the full control, so you don't even, I mean, they don't even steal our data, but they most of the times um, also damage the data, so they can just use the delete command and the data is gone, which is the biggest nightmare for big corporations, even us as a private people. And they can even ask ransom for that data. Well, they do that, yeah. yeah. There's also, when thinking like out loud, Centralized servers, there's a physical restrictions to it all. I mean, they're very, they demand a lot of space, right? They demand a lot of space, they demand a lot of energy, and the cost of having your data on AWS or Azure or um, other clouds is uh, recurrent costs every month. So even, I mean, if you see a small example of um, end customer side, which we guys pay for Android or iOS, is the cost which we have every month for our... Um, Technicalities. 
Did I do something wrong? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, what I was saying is, we are paying every month costs for our iCloud or for Android for to store our pictures or the data which we have. These recurrent costs are every corporation is paying. This is. Um, this is not what you have to do in blockchain. In blockchain, once you put the data on the blockchain, you actually own the space or the data on the blockchain. So there is no recurrent cost, which makes it much more cost effective, which is the second aspect after the security. So having a data on the blockchain is the whole data replicated over hundreds of, of nodes, which are anonymous people all around the web, all around the world. Anybody can be a master node. Anybody can actually be a node of a public blockchain. Um, of course, you have to have some kind of specifications you have to fill for the hardware and some kind of um, staking protocols for the POS, uh, proof of stake blockchains, which you need to do. Um, but full, fulfilling those conditions, you can become a node and nobody knows who you are. So as long as a copy of a blockchain is live on one node, your data is always there. And it's very, very difficult. It's almost impossible. We call it 99.9% .9 to hack a blockchain because you can compromise maybe one or two or five nodes, but you cannot compromise the whole system of a public blockchain. So let me see if I get this straight. Decentralized data centers, they would compete against somebody like Google, right? In terms of data storage, is that correct? Um, they would compete against Microsoft, Google, um, Amazon, everyone. But there are still limitations of what you can do on the decentralized space with the data. The solutions or the, the features which Amazon Web Services or AWS, which started maybe 20 years back, is, is providing now, cannot be completely replicated or the same solutions cannot be done on the blockchain. We are way too early. We are in the very early times um, in the beginning of the, this Web 3.0 revolution. I think we will cope up or we will even scale up and be better than AWS in the next coming five to 10 years maximum. So you could have actually everything which AWS is providing you or Microsoft or, or even SAP um, on the decentralized part in coming few years. Something that I'm thinking about, we're talking about putting data in decentralized nodes so it makes it more secure because it should not be, it's very, very difficult to hack. But it also, I think, it might mean in the minds of somebody, perhaps government, mean a loss of control. So for example, national ID data. I'm pretty sure that governments want to keep that safe, but also want to control that. Do you imagine yourself, do you, do you imagine governments going for a decentralized solution to the to this kind of problem? So there are two aspects to it. You know, there is one pub public blockchain where an individual or a government who puts the data on the blockchain actually owns the rights to that data with through the private key and they own the right to share the data through the public key. But when you're saying when it comes to institutions or the governments, um, the real security of the data actually lies in public blockchain. If you have a private blockchain, it's at least my personal opinion, you lose the real benefit of the blockchain because it's again, it's a set of servers which one entity controls. So okay, your data is replicated and your data is on maybe 20, 30, 50 servers, which are your nodes, but you are the one who's actually um, kind of owner of all this structure, so you can manipulate the blocks which are uh, being done in the blockchain, whereas in the public blockchain, this is not possible. So do government lose the control? No, because in the end, if they use public blockchain, and as long as they are in possession of their private key, they are the real owner of the data. They don't lose control. In their minds, I think they're, we are still very early, so they would think that they are losing control because nobody owns the blockchain. It's all run by random people. doesn't sound very good for the governments. Uh, but it's, I mean, whatever we have at the moment, technological, I think it's much more safe than that. Now, 
from a cost-effective point of view, is it efficient to use the blockchain technology right now, or, or what is it efficient for, cost, you know, in terms of cost efficiency? So the blockchain technology is um, comparatively very cost efficient for the solutions it's providing. Um, let, let's maybe I will I will give an example of of our own project, which is the Ainry Layer One blockchain, the full decentralized data uh, management system. If you compare us with other big corporations, which I give you an example before, there is no recurrent costs. The cost of setup is very low. The cost of maintenance is very low. Putting a data in a completely secure manner for maybe a few years is very low um, as comparison to the corporation because we eliminate this big cost of data centers. You know, just the energy cost of data center to keep it cool, the servers where they are, is enormous. Then you have a space, then you have fiber optics, you have firewalls, you have uh, cybersecurity protocols, you have people. All these costs are eliminated when it's a blockchain because it's just it's it's a self-running system based on a community uh, which is which is which are the nodes who build it. So I think the limitations is that the blockchain at this moment cannot um, provide all the features which the centralized cloud centers or the data centers are doing. But what features it provides is much more cost effective. I think one of the, I mean, we'll call it, I think the cost of blockchain is one of the hundredth as comparison to those centralized cloud servers. And let's say I'm a company and we'll go into and take the advantages of the blockchain technology. What competitive edge will I have against those that don't embrace this technology? Well, your rivals cannot steal your data. That's the biggest competitive advantage. Let's say we are two companies here, you are using blockchain technologies and I'm using the old school server part. And two years from now, my data has been compromised and it's been stolen and the ransom has been asked, or it's, I'm a listed company and the narrative goes out that the consumer's data, which we see every day in news, has been uh, stolen by the hackers. The share plunges and I lose hundreds of millions in like one hour. Whereas you have your data on the blockchain and it doesn't happen to you, so you have a lot of competitive edge there. And that's something that's very difficult to put a price on, right? Well, nobody is safe, you know, as long as you're on the centralized part, this is a price we have to pay. Let me ask you a bit about your company specifically. Which industries do your customers come from? So we have not launched our mainnet yet. The mainnet launch is the next quarter. We are now in the, the last phase of public testnet. That means we put the blockchain um, outside for the public to register as node and test the blockchain, do different tasks on it, test, uh, test the, the speed of the blocks, test the speed of the transactions, do different tasks. And once the mainnet is launched, or even now, we have started with companies which are in defense sectors, which are very sensitive with the data. Um, we have tied up with companies in health sector. We have tied up companies which are into revenue and land department sectors, so you know the transactions which take place of um, having the land titles thing, and then different kind of decentralized applications which are on different chains at the moment who are still using a centralized database. So a database is kind of like a heart and a brain of a company. And if your database is centralized, then it doesn't matter if your decentralized application is on a blockchain, um, you still have a single point of failure. And that's what we are targeting, to go to every decentralized or a centralized application, plus going to all the um, different protocols that the, the developers are developing, even in the Web 2.0 space, and telling them, look, we are giving you a tool, an infrastructure part where you guys can actually use a decentralized protocol so at least the core of your, your application is immutable and it's secure. If the core is secure, then, I mean, there will be other companies which are providing other things, but we are totally focused on the decentralized database systems. You mentioned before that in your testnet there are more than... 2,400 uh, nodes. Yes. Do I get any benefits from l l giving you my, my hardware and becoming a node? Well, yes. This is so. This is a, a, a fundamental question where I would like to highlight that maybe most of the people know about that, but if they don't, 
um, this cryptocurrency or this, this crypto world is a very small aspect connected to the blockchain. A blockchain is, because it's independent, it's decentralized, it's run by its own, you can call it its own economic system. And the economic system is then um, drived by its native token. That's one as Ethereum is, or, or, or Solana, or Avalanche, or Algorand, or you name any layer one blockchain. They have their own native token, and anything which you do on the blockchain, if you do any kind of transaction, you store your data, you run the query, you pull your data, you need to have X or Y amount of those tokens to do that transaction. So it's like, it, you can imagine it like a small country, and it's its own currency within the country. And when the people outside from space, which has, who have uh, financial perspectives, when they see, ah, okay, this ecosystem looks pretty robust, there's a very good backing of people, Technology is very robust, so let's we buy this token and see when the, the whole ecosystem is growing, the price of the token will grow. That's where the, the crypto, the exchanges, the trading part comes in. But if you come on the technological part, a token is actually designed to benefit the ecosystem. So I need to have a token if I do a transaction. Now what happens, the token is then split and it's given to the nodes who are actually doing the validation of the transactions, who are storing the data, or building the blocks, or validation, so they're constantly working in it. And they get an incentive of that token, which they can then go in a free market and sell it where the other traders buy it and get incentivized in the, in the financial way. So yes, if you're not, you make money. You get tokens. Yes. And you mentioned before, the, so, uh, it's a proof of stake consensus, right? It's a proof of stake. Let's talk about, a little bit about that. Oh my God, we're being hacked. <laughs> <laughs> we got proof of stake and we have proof of work. Yes. We, those, for those of you who are not aware, Ethereum moved from proof of work to proof of stake not quite recently. Could you please explain a little bit about that? And my question would be, do you see proof of work disappearing to proof of stake? Is that possible? Well, yes, actually the Ethereum example is, the, the second part of your question is that proof of stake is taking over proof of work. The reason is the high energy cost. Um, one of the major blockchains which is still out there is Bitcoin. And you cannot change this consensus because it's just designed this way and it's a self-running part. Proof of stake makes it um, a very cost effective. So you have less cost because the um, high energy um, graphic cards, hardware, uh, the whole computational uh, part, high demands are there and that leads to a very uh, high cost. So the reason Ethereum actually changed was because the, the gas fees, which we call this transactional fees, was very high. Very good for the miners or very good for the guys who actually run the nodes, very profitable. Um, bad for the people who use the ecosystem because it gets too pricey and it actually defeats the whole purpose. So this balance was kind of not there and it was disbalanced and now making it proof of stake, it's balanced. So the proof of work is you actually um, work to solve the, the validation algorithm and the proof of stake is you stake X number of tokens to become the node, which is kind of your security, that if you don't adhere to the rules or the regulations of the ecosystem, then those tokens can be um, kind of confiscated and then uh, you could be thrown out of the system. It's like a deposit, you can put it that way. Yes, like a fixed deposit. Okay, and what's the, the minimum required on your layer one blockchain for the, for the staking, for, for being a node under proof of stake? So we started, I mean, in the beginning we put it 50,000 tokens, but then we thought that the same problem will happen, which is now happening with the Ethereum, because Ethereum started with, I think, less than a dollar, and now it, it went to $4,000. Mm -hmm. So if you just put it in the tokens, uh, it comes to a price where you, you cannot actually become a node. So we, we now um, came it and we said, look, are we going to peg it for $15,000? So the amount of tokens which is equal to $50,000, you can become a master node. Um, you can become a light, light node in much less. The light nodes are not the ones who run the full blockchain on their system. They just do small transaction validations. And um, 
Now, pegging it to, to the 15,000 years, did we actually eliminate the risk of the token goes too high or too mm -hmm. low? It's still all the avenues are open for the people who wants to come and, and join um, the, the node in So the token equivalent of 50k? 15k. 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15. Okay, good. Now this is a more philosophical kind of question. Blockchain, in, as I understand it, means perhaps incorporating and analyzing more data than before or the same data in a better way. So why are we humans constantly looking for more data? And is our mind, like from an evolutionary point of view, can we actually manage all that data? Well, I don't know about others, but I don't think I cannot manage that data. <laughs> you see, we get like every day a few hundred messages on Telegram and then at least a few hundred on WhatsApp, and then you get emails, and then you get people writing on your LinkedIn, and then on Twitter. And we try to stay on that, but in the end, you know, I end up forgetting a lot of people's names, which is not a nice thing, you know. And then a lot of things. So, you, I mean, we are consuming constantly a lot of data. Um, can we process it all? Can we keep it in our memory? Can we retrieve it when it's needed? I cannot. I don't know about others, maybe they have much better mental capabilities. I think what happens is sometimes, most of the times our system gets like overflowed by the data uh, consumption which we're doing. And in the end it just doesn't make any sense because the whole data mixes up and you forget what day it was and who said what and this and that. Um, I think it's going to go more and more, the applications which is coming in and the the way internet and the smartphones and the communications and the connectivity is connecting us all, I think data is going to be the biggest asset and also um, it's going to be huge amounts of data coming, um, um, generating every day, more and more. Yeah, and one could beg the question if, if all that excessive amount of, that, of data is giving us any proper value added. I mean, couldn't we be getting the same output with perhaps less data? Or less no, data the analysis? More, the more data is actually better. It just depends if you can analyze the data properly or not. So the data analytics part or the machine learning or, or artificial intelligence actually work when you feed the more and more data so they can take the trends out of it. But just having random uh, more data without running the analytics or visualization, it, it doesn't make any sense. It's but just... My point would be, let me rephrase the question. What's the, the marginal gain from, the, from new data? So I, I don't know if any of you know, I'm an economist, so macroeconomics. Let's say that when you want to estimate GDP, which is perhaps one of the most difficult things to do in, in macroeconomics, well, you go, you, you do your thing, blah, blah, blah. Let's say now we want to, and the result was with the current technology, the GDP grew by 3.0%. Now we go and we add all of this new technology, all of this new data, which is incredibly expensive, more time consuming, you need a lot more people. The result is GDP grew by 3.01%. So one, one decimal of marginal revenue in terms of the, you know, the, the kind of data that we get. My question is perhaps on, on that side. It, if the, if the, wh how do we decide if the marginal revenue from all this excessive data analysis that we're doing is good enough. <laughs> so, in terms of microeconomics, uh, what you're saying may be right, but if you see companies like WhatsApp, what's their revenue model? They're giving you their applications free, they're giving you hundreds and hundreds of terabytes space for storing our pictures, our chats, and everything. Why are they doing that? They should be bankrupt long ago. I mean, there's a huge cost we're talking about on infrastructure. The whole revenue comes from data. They know how to um, churn the trends out of data and how to actually sell them or benefit from them. So data is a very beneficial business. If you see in the, in the corporate sector of data, and that's why big corporations, uh, I mean, just take data from any part, take data from NASDAQ, take data history from stocks, from, take data from crypto uh, portfolios. The more data you have, the better predictions you can. Uh, it's again, the data should not be just a huge piles of data which you cannot do anything with. 
But if it's structured data, or which you can, if it's unstructured, but you can still uh, run your queries and get a structure or get the, uh, do the data mining and get the trends and analytics out of it, it's, um, I think it's the most um, profiting part at this moment. We, you just mentioned WhatsApp revenues model. If you don't mind my asking, your company's revenue model, is it like subscription-based? Is it like you go in, you help them set their technology, you get paid and you go? How are you, how are you uh, thinking about the business of blockchain and data analysis? So our company's business model is, is very simple. There is a, there's a framework for the, for the database which costs one time to, to get it costs $30 as comparison to the other centralized databases which cost $60 plus, so it's less than um, half of that. And after that, anything you do with this data or how much amount of data you put, it all goes on the blockchain. And there again on the blockchain, it's all the value or anything you do with the data is derived from the, from the native token on the blockchain. So the more and more use of the blockchain or more and more use of and, and adaptability of the, of the database drives the value of the native token. And the value of the native token goes up and all the participants in the whole ecosystem, it could be Node, it could be us founders, it could be uh, people who have actually um, invested with us um, or the early users of the the technology or the guys who stake the tokens to get the space on the blockchain, every one of them profit because the whole ecosystem is growing in terms of the valuation. Now let me ask you some perhaps more personal questions. How did you get into this business? Because, I mean, blockchain wasn't born when we were born. I mean, it's quite new. So blockchain came up after us. So. My guess is that you weren't in the blockchain business and you transitioned into it. Is that correct? Yes. I was into IT from more than last 10 years. I was into data, so mostly on the health data. But this blockchain thing, the transition that happened like three or three and a half years back, um, when we started using the blockchain part to, um, to harness the benefits of the blockchain into the data part. So it started with a very uh, kind of vague approach and then things became clear and clear and clear where we want to go. And um, we started working on it. My co-founder and my partner, he is uh, the CTO of the company and we have a very solid tech team. They're all based out of Serbia, which gives me um, a lot of free hand because I don't have to, to actually care about the technical part, which is the, the major part in, in a blockchain part. So. Uh, that gives me a huge relief so I can sit and talk with you guys. <laughs> and those guys are working hard. There. <laughs> they work and you come here, you drink your coffee. That's it. Can you give us your best guess on how old blockchain is? Can somebody uh, say blockchain was born on this day, this year? I would say whatever everyone else is saying, that the blockchain was in 2008 by Satoshi Nakamoto it actually came into existence through Bitcoin blockchain. Okay. Uh, maybe it's, it's before that. I know a team of engineers from Germany who actually uh, uh, wrote a code which was doing the communication between the nodes, but it was just the communication between the nodes, nothing to do with the blockchain, but the full blockchain architecture, I think, came with uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin. And for the young crowd hearing us here present, if they want to learn about blockchain, who should they listen to? Who should they follow? Who should they read? Because it's not easy to get like good quality information about this, this topic, which is kind of difficult to grasp. So what would you recommend in order to start getting into this business? I think now it's a lot of um uh, literature and a lot of things available in the public domain, which is all free of cost. So starting from, I mean, of course, you need to, to filter out starting from YouTubes to Udemy to uh, different other universities. And now it's uh, Harvard, the uh, University of California, a lot of there, a lot of publications about how actually proof of stake works, proof of work works, and all these things. I think there is a lot of uh, thing now 
on there and a lot of other guys, influencers who make it very easy to actually make people understand what those technical guys were saying. Um, I think it's now, as compared to five years back, is much easier. I mean, I started it in 2016, I think, and 15, 16 with a book on blockchain, which I understood half of it. <laughs> but now, if you see in YouTube, there are people giving uh, amazing explanations. There's perhaps for, for younger people, what you you what you said brings me to something that I think it's quite important. A lot of people are now self self learning. They go into YouTube, they watch a bunch of videos, and they start calling themselves experts on whatever. People from my generation, I'm 37, we are used to like formal studying, going to university, getting your degree, then getting a master's, then perhaps getting a PhD. Uh, how do you feel about how ed education seems to be changing from like formal education that perhaps you and me had to more of this self-learning kind of thing that the, the younger kids are getting? I love it. You know, before we need I am to so work. against it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have two schools. Before we need, we were based on the universities to professors. We need to ask them this and that. Now, I learned from an 18-year-old kid, you know, and you right, learn how, how can you know that that 18-year-old kid or whoever you're consuming on, online is actually good at what he does and he's actually telling the, the, the right kind of stuff? How do you know that your professor is writing the right thing? That's true, but there's some sort of validation from, you know, from the institution. Only validation from institution, you know. Well, this is a wild, wild west. There is no institution. There is a <laughs> self-regulated party. And that's, that's the revolution which is coming. So I can feel your pain. I come from the same school, but we have to adopt it. Okay. I saw somebody clapping there. <laughs> Those are the guys that learn from you too. Hold on. You're going you're gonna to get a surgeon that went to YouTube school and then we're going to have the same conversation. Well, as long as he saves my life, I'm okay with it. You know? <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, I was reading the website from your company and in your roadmap it says, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, for, the, for the future it says importing existing, like what, what are your, your next goals, right? Importing existing non-relational databases from different solutions into the Inari DB database system. So, what databases, what industries are you aiming for, and why? So, there are normally there are two kinds of databases. One is relational, and one is non-relational. And um, ours is more ours non-relational because it's much more flexible. So, relational databases like MySQL is a SQL-based uh, database which you. Uh, the, the rules are very tight and there are limited things which you can do with the data. Data is structured, whereas non-relational, um, you can do a lot with the data. The freedom is, is actually a lot more. So we decided to go to, with the non-relational, which is now um, increasing very fast. Still, the 60% of the database is used uh, until now were relational, but now non-relational has started 10 years back and has now took over 40% of the whole market. And within non-relation, there are different databases which have different protocols and they are based on different languages um, and they support different other languages. For example, even a WordPress website, you can choose what kind of database you'll be using. So we will be adopting all of them into the blockchain technologies. So you would have a framework which is, uh, let's say you can build a WordPress website using a fully decentralized database without even being a professor or knowing about blockchain. You're just a sim simple web, web developer. You're developing a website in WordPress, and you can choose Inary database, and you can actually harness the benefits of the blockchain. So your website is maybe hosted on a server, which maybe tomorrow can be hacked because it's on a centralized server. But the data which is on the blockchain, the backend, would always be there. So nobody can actually go hack your website and delete everything out of that. So what we want to do is we want to go to the mass adoption of decentralized databases, you know, so that all the databases which are there, you add a decentralized part of the database there, and then you build different libraries of different um, um, languages, and then you also build different protocols so that all existing uh, blockchains or decentralized applications on the blockchain 
can use your database without facing the trouble of, okay, this is a different language, I cannot do that, or I have to again start from zero to build my application. You don't have to do that. You can actually just seamless transfer from centralized database to decentralized database. This is what we are trying to do. And perhaps one final question before we move on to your, your interaction with the audience. We've been talking mostly over-the-top uh, solutions from blockchain, but how do you imagine blockchain changing everyday life in the, in the near future? Well, you see a lot of 18-year-old guys going in Lamborghinis. That's how it's changing. <laughs> <laughs> That's their life. Well, you ask lives. <laughs> their lives matter too. So I think um, we're in the very start of blockchain. And again, crypto is a small part, which financial part, which is, which is related to the blockchain. Um, you will see a more and more technological um, uh, intervention or I would say participation of blockchain in the, in the web space. And you would see more and more people who will come and say, okay, for me, very important is that I'm the owner of my data or I'm the owner of my participation of internet, which is the Web 3.0 revolution about. And I think all of us who are here now um, would actually agree that if we participate or if it's our data, then we should decide who shall we share the data with not the other companies who actually own our data. Um, so I think it's it's just tip of the iceberg. We're going to go crazily. Blockchain is going to be everywhere, from banks, real estate, aviation, you name it. How, how do we buy blockchain stocks then? Well, you buy crypto. <laughs> All, right. All right, guys. So now is the proper time for the master class. So take advantage of this moment. Go at it at this guy. So anyone has anything to ask? Well, Imagine we have the she... professor here, so. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, let me. Is it working? It's not. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for a very interesting and nice uh, talk. I really enjoyed all of it. I have a curious question for you. You mentioned you have 2,500 nodes around, yes. yeah? Scattered in how many countries? 36. 36, okay. What is your view on this, like the geographical uh, scattering or decentralization, if we wish? So the, the view of how the nodes should or should not be scattered globally, or does it really matter in the end of the day on the layer one? I would be happy if it will be 136 countries, <laughs> you know, so the real decentralization takes part. But uh, as long as they don't come, even if it's in one country, like a big country, I don't know, India, Russia, Canada, US, which is really geographical big, if you have nodes, there is um, there are less chances that these guys are all together, but if it's scattered in different countries, then it's a pure decentralization. So the more scattered, it's better, my opinion. Thank you. I actually agree with you. And if I may comment on this where to start to find information, uh, my strong recommendation and my 18 years ago was really, really long time ago. <laughs> I would uh, actually suggest everyone to read the Bitcoin white paper. To start with that, it's not a long document, but it kind of opens the whole thing up. And then whatever direction you want to take, I think that's a good point to start with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone from Microsoft? We had somebody over here, I think. <coughs> In the meantime, let me ask you, do you think Satoshi exists? Is he one guy? I don't know. <laughs> Very difficult question. I cannot answer that. Well. Thank you for the amazing presentation. Uh, I just want to ask, so you've mentioned that the, this technology is cost efficient and it's more secure. If that is so, then what's stopping the big corporation from adopting it? And just as a follow-up question, what's the obstacle that's making it uh, not massly adopted as of now? So big corporations, if you see the history, any big institution, they are always um, against the changes. You know, they are CEOs with big bonuses and they don't want to actually shake, the, stir the pot. They just want to be in their comfort zone. So anything which came 
um, they actually discouraged internet and they discouraged uh, everything. So we, uh, chairman of our company is Mr. Simon Murray. This guy is in his 80s. He was the founder of Orange Telecom. He was a group CEO of Hutchinson Wimpoa. He was the CEO of Deutsche Bank. He was um, he's on board of Rothschild Bank. He was chairman of Glencore. So he has been places on the top places in the world. And um, he said this small story in, I think, two, three weeks ago in Abu Dhabi. We had a Middle East Blockchain Awards, and he was speaking there. When telecoms, mobile phones came, um, he was the group CEO of Hutchinson that time, and he said to the owner of Hutchinson, Mr. Lee, who was one of the richest um, Chinese or one of the richest men in the, in the world, that we should actually adopt mobile telephone, and we should use it, and we should invest into it. So they told, uh, he told him, um, Simon, this technology is never going to work. Um, he said, look, the, the size of a mobile phone is like a briefcase. And if anybody calls me, I pick up, I have to pay. He said, I don't want to pay. That's why I'm a billionaire. So who's going who's gonna to buy a mobile phone if you call you and you pay? And then Simon said, I told him, this is, this is actually your convenience that you can talk to somebody when you are in car uh, instead of going home or in office and telling your assistant to call them and bring them online and this and that. So it's going to work. It's all about convenience. They didn't believe it. And the biggest opposition of mobile phone companies was, I don't know how many guys you know, were all the big telecom giants, from AT&T to everyone. They were all against mobile because they were making their revenues through landline. And they were absolutely against mobile companies. And what happened then? When the convenience is there, when the, you are actually solving a problem and there is actual use case, the technology is going gonna, is gonna to grow. I think a CEO, one of the CEO of, I think, JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs in 2016 said that crypto is absolutely scam and nothing has happened. And now see what they're doing. They're building funds of billions to invest in that. That thing happened in five years. Just imagine what happened in the next five years. Okay. Uh, great analogy. Just one thing. So when you mentioned about the mobile phone, you are at least giving an argument against it. Okay, you have to pay. What's the argument against this technology? The you don't have to pay. No. <laughs> so there's there no argument, argument against it. What's the argument against the data blockchain? Chain. I yeah, cannot blockchain. speak against blockchain, buddy. No. You don't do that. <laughs> Thanks also on my behalf. Very, very good panel. Thank you. Or oh, fire chat. But yeah, uh, <clears throat> you mentioned about the uh, token has a minimum role. I, let me politely disagree. First of all, I believe that you said that the uh, with validations and you need to have token, which is the data on the network to validate the transactions. The problem is that, for example, here in UAE, there's a law. As long as you keep your stake token on the blockchain, it's totally legal. But when you actually will get some benefit for yourself, getting money out of the blockchain, it's not legal. It's not illegal, but it's not legal. So how do you see that regulations, that regulators should react and behave and take this? Or do we need them like fully be regulated? Tokens, I mean. I think even regulators have decided or they have started looking at that, that as long as there is a proper utility of a token, I mean, is there, either there is a proper utilization of a token, a utility token, which is again a gray zone because a lot of tokens, uh, I see a lot of projects that say, okay, this is our token. I said, okay, what does your token do? Oh, you can stake it. I said, well, <laughs> this is not a utility. So as long as it's a real utility where you say, for example, uh, a layer one public blockchain where you say, hey, um, you cannot do any transaction without having tokens or gas fees in your wallet, for example, Ethereum. It's a real utility. You cannot do smart contracts without having Ethereum on your thing. As long as it's a utility, I think regulators are now starting saying, okay, utility token is okay. You can actually uh, deal with it in, in lawful manner. And I think without utility, it's still very difficult. And you don't know then which is scam and which is not scam. It's difficult to think. So I'm for utility tokens. Well, 
if I'm a node and I cannot withdraw the money, why would I run a blockchain? <laughs> you know, this is the this is typical human nature. It's 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 work and incentivize. You, I'm sure, sir, you work somewhere and you get salary. I mean, would you work without there's salary? There's no regulation. That's the problem. As long as it's a blockchain, it's good for everybody. I am with you. I'm with you, but I cannot change it, can I? We should actually, um, I don't know. I have no <laughs> idea what we can do, you know. Difficult task. We can try. As long as they don't put us in jail, it's okay. <laughs> Hi, Naveen. Uh, thank you for you know, providing so much value and really coming in and giving us a talk today. Uh, I'm Ramsey, and I've, I've got a question about your staking mechanism. So firstly, like with a five-figure uh, minimum requirement, do you see third parties kind of coming in on-chain or in, like a CEX coming in and offering um, like liquid staking pools for uh, your token? And if so, do you think that like this kind of compromises security somewhat? Uh, like, you know, for example, um, right now with... Ethereum, Lido Finance has 30 percent of the on-chain on liquid staking. So if a company comes in, say, for example, gets like around 51 percent of all the tokens, they can kind of just put like a civil attack on you. Um, and if this does happen, what are like your kind of uh, solutions to this? So it's highly unlikely this will happen because we have allocated the biggest number of tokens to the ecosystem, which no protocol has done now. 46% of our tokens are um, allocated to ecosystem for the next 15, 20 years. Then the rest remaining tokens, uh, we are the only layer one who actually is, I would say, bootstrap. We raised only $7 million from crowdfunding with a cap of maximum uh, investment of $20,000. So we built a huge community out of that. They invested into that. We didn't take one big C, uh, VC. We didn't take one big fund. We didn't took, um, we have been offered, we didn't took an investment of 10, 20, 50 million because uh, we thought it's not needed at the moment. When the time comes when we are so big and we are on that valuation, we will take it. So we have tried our best that this doesn't happen. Um, it's highly unlikely this happened. Uh, because of the 46% of the total token allocation which has been given to the ecosystem. Um, Leo is, is a tokenomics expert. Um, I didn't get a chance to talk to you, but this, this is uh, what we allocated to saying, okay, um, it doesn't matter if the team or the everyone stakeholder gets less token. It's important is the people who run that because we see uh, scalability is a very important part of our um, blockchain. The amount of... Um, response we are getting is very positive from different corporations and people. So what will happen if a huge amount of data is on the blockchain? You need to have the, the nodes really incentivized pretty well, uh, which the gentleman now will again say that they're going to take the <laughs> token and sell it. They, they will. Um, so it's very uh, highly unlikely that it will happen. And like just as a small follow-up, so in regards to recent events, are you still kind of supportive of a CEX listing? at some point? Well, we, just before this event, I, we got listed on Huobi. And we were in talks to list on FTX before that happened. <laughs> lucky. <laughs> yeah, well, luckily. <laughs> and uh, the, 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 the issue is um, the volumes and the people, if you meet everybody, the way they are um, doing, they are all on centralized exchanges. There is very less participation on the DEXs. So unfortunately, we have to do that. But we have been um, very stubborn and strict on that. We told all the, um, we have six exchanges now lined up. We told them, everyone, guys, we don't pay any security fees. We don't do listing fees. We are a pure tech project. You list it, don't list it. It's all up to you. Um, we don't provide source code until unless the mainnet is launched. So we've been very stubborn. And few exchanges said, well, we are the king. We don't take you. And few, few understood. So it's a kind of, you know, uh, wild west out there. Thank you. Hi, uh, Naveen. How's it yes, going? it's working.
Oh, hello. Yes. Um, uh, first off, congratulations on building a layer one, and secondly, one that's what I would consider properly decentralized with thousands of nodes. How were you able to achieve and incentivize the nodes to run a master node, and how are you able to incentivize them to continue to be a part of your network? So when we started the public test net, I mean, this is an admission which um, I should not make on camera, but it's okay. It's a public blockchain. So when we started, we thought the maximum number of nodes we will attain should be, would be like around 300. That's how we started. And we, um, we built a task system. So there are seven tasks to be completed until the blockchain is completely tested. We did three rounds of private test net. Um, as I mentioned before, the biggest thing which we have is I have, our tech team is very, very solid. Uh, they're all in a European country called Serbia who is considered as a very um, high level tech guys. And we have now, we started with six guys and we have now uh, 30 plus tech guys. We are tied up with three universities. We take a lot of um, fresh blood, very um, young and very talented guys, especially from uh, computer sciences and mathematics, and um, amazing brains. So when we started with it, we, we put the seven task systems, and our um, CTO, he is actually not a, he's more of a business guy than techie. Is it me? Sorry. So um, he came up with this seven task system and you finish a task and you're incentivized with um, X amount of tokens, which are again then locked. You cannot just sell them, but you are part of the ecosystem then. And it went from 100, 200, 300, 500. And we needed to then um, stop and update the consensus mechanism. Uh, because if you see any blockchain, um, I would not name any, but they are more or less, less than 100 nodes, most of the blockchain. Or even if they have a lot of nodes there, their, their blockchain is actually regulated or actually controlled by maybe 20 nodes. And we didn't want it to do that. Um, so if you increase the number of nodes, they have to now stop their blockchain and they have to work on their validation consensus mechanism and stuff. And then it went up more than 1,000. And then it's like, whoa. Uh, you know, and then it went 1,500. It went about 2,000. Um, so I think it's our biggest success so far, um, much bigger than listing or doing anything else. Um, and I think once we launch the mainnet, and within the first month, we will have 1,000 master nodes. Um, that's the feeling. I mean, I, I think we will have that. Thank you. Let me ask you a follow-up on that. <laughs> Why do you think you, you, you were so successful in getting so, so many nodes at the beginning? I think we didn't do any kind of marketing. It's just word of mouth because the, the technical community, they love to play with new toys and they mm -hmm. see, okay, there's something new which they're really trying to bring something new in the terms of uh, data management. And the technical community just um, uh, adopted us. And this is the most important part than you know, having a big corporation adoption. The technical community is really, and it's word of mouth. Any ideas? Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Um, it's working. Where would you, where would you see the biggest advantage um, from your chain to other chains also using POAs? Once again, biggest where, advantage. Where would you see? Where would you see the biggest advantage from your chain um, compared to other chains also using POS? Um, I didn't get the question, sorry. So, P all the chains which are on POS. No, yeah, exactly. Where do you see your um, competitor advantage from, from the chain that you are building now? Ah, okay. Um, very good question. We are not competing with anyone. There is actually no one in this space. There are a lot of layer ones. The issue with layer one is uh, all the layer ones are kind of like competing each other to get more and more projects on their chain to build. Uh, and they're saying, okay, we got like 100 projects which are there giving grants and stuff. Whereas we are not telling anybody to come and build on our chain. We are saying, stay wherever chain you are. 
Just don't use centralized database, use a decentralized database because you cannot call yourself a decentralized application um, as long as you use a, a centralized database because you have a single point of failure. So we are actually handing out, uh, extending our arm and giving a tool to all the um, applications which are out there and telling them to adopt a decentralized database where, wherever it's applicable and leave the centralizer. For example, um, decentralized exchanges, they're all using centralized databases, even they are decentralized exchanges. Decentralized application, doesn't matter if it's on Polygon, Solana, wherever, they are still using all the central, uh, DBs because there isn't any decentralized DB. So our narrative is very simple. Stay where you are, build where, or on whichever chain is compatible with you, just use the database um, which is decentralized. It's ours or maybe any, another one, just use that. So just putting a question mark of against 200,000 plus decentralized applications there and telling them, guys, you are not decentralized until unless you use a decentralized database. It's a completely different approach. Anyone else? Guys, you have grilled me enough now. <laughs> <laughs> Should we let him be? Should we let him go get his coffee? I'm going to run out like a bullet now. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you very no much. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so now we have a short break again for some coffee and wine and Check one, two. Check one, two, check one, two.
welcome back. So we are going to finish our day and that interesting masterclass with Fabrice Brassard you met this morning from Ecochar. You're COO of Ecochar, right? Correct. And uh, so the last part will be about making blockchain environmentally friendly. Uh, and for tomorrow, people uh, will have the program outside and I will be here to tell you again. And uh, so enjoy that last masterclass and uh, there, there will be a few questions too, right? Enjoy. Can you hear me properly? Yes, there we go. So second masterclass of the day, final session. We've survived through the first day. That's always good. So now we have the pleasure of having Fabrice with us for a second time. And we're going to take this moment to listen to him explaining us exactly his business, what he's doing. During the first session, we focus mo mostly on the military aspect of the drones that you're building, but you're also doing some civilian stuff, correct? Yeah, correct. Um, so, two different companies. Uh, one, as you probably understood, is involved in the design manufacturing of uh, heavy drones. Um, and, and that one is uh, related to the second company that I'm also uh, running um, due to the fact that um, we want to fight against uh, deforestation. So, wildlife monitoring is one of the aspects um, that I'm, I'm going to talk about. So. Um, Ecoshar is um, a company that I, I created in uh, 2017, but I spent um, the last 20 years uh, working on um, deforestation and uh, regenerative uh, agricultural uh, stuff. Um, let, let, me, let me stop you right there. Deforestation. There are so many issues about the environment. Why did you guys pick deforestation? <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a good question. So I started my career um, working with the World Bank mm -hmm. uh, under the auspice of the Ministry of Finance um, in DC. And um, um, we were talking at that time, you know, about a major, uh, the major aspect of um, climate change, uh, global warming. And um, I, I did realize that um, one of the major challenges uh, that we would uh, face would be to actually uh, preserve uh, the ecosystem. So because of that, uh, and I'm, I tr I'm trying to be a very uh, practical, uh, pragmatic guy, um, I was like, well, uh, how could we, you know, eventually help uh, those communities and, and, and bring up, you know, a technology uh, where, you know, we could eventually um, substitute um, um, well, uh, firewood, uh, so uh, charcoal, and uh, other stuff. So, um, from you know the the, the job that I, I started at, at the World Bank, I tried to uh, actually understand uh, the ins and outs, uh, and 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 get you know a bit more uh, um, in in diff with uh, what we could uh, do. So, just to give you some figures, uh, so that we. We know what we're talking about. Um, every second, there is the equivalent of a football pitch that disappear on Earth. So we're talking about a green area. You mean right? On a worldwide scale. Wow. All right. So that means that we, we're losing almost like 13 million hectares per year. Um, we have four uh, billion hectares uh, on that uh, wonderful planet. It means that you know one-third, uh, well, the forests cover one-third of the land area. Um, but at, at the path uh, it's going, um, we may lose, you know, uh, the, that ecosystem that is going to be, you know, uh, essential for our survival. Uh, and I know that you may think, well, it's very pessimistic, but uh, yes, I am because I've been working in um, quite a long time with uh, very well-known, you know, uh, scientist. Um, and uh, it's really a drama uh, what we're facing. And I, I think, you know, just to give you in perspective uh, and, and get a better sense of what we, the challenge that we are going to face um, by 2050, 
Um, the population uh, should be around like more or less 10 billion. Uh, we will need more, um, I mean, 60% more food, 55% more water, and almost 80% more energy. So um, the difficulty is that um, you have to think um, that uh, we, we're facing, um, you know, scarcity uh, resource, and it's going to be, you know, essential to manage uh, those resources. Either we, we become more efficient or we die. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, I, I you know, I've, I've, I think um, survival is here. Um, I also consider, and, and I'm happy because I, I saw, you know, uh, young, you know, young uh, software engineers asking <laughs> very uh, clever questions, and, and they they represent the future. Um, I, I I believe that um, we have a legacy, and our legacy should be, you know, to leave a better world for the future generation. So um, I wish I was, uh, young, you know, younger. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Uh, so I have that responsibility to try to bring uh, technologies and, and, and the thing uh, now with blockchain is that uh, that's the beauty of it. Um, each of us can contribute and help uh, develop uh, the right answer because, uh, you know, time is counting. And let's go back to, to the drones. What exactly is the role of these drones in looking out for the environment? So, um, for the drones, uh, we, we, we currently uh, train to develop um, aerial observation uh, platform. Up to now, um, you know, um, most of the observation that we're making are based on, you know, the satellite imageries. Um, and, and, and one of the reasons, not that we don't have the capacities to do this with uh, uh, bigger craft, but uh, the cost is the main uh, issue. Um, that's why, you know, I was uh, just, um, and I, I emphasize that uh, light airborne may, you know, change the future uh, in, in the aviation. Um, and, and with our drones, like to get back to you answer, um, so it's 100% um, um, full carbon uh, drones. Uh, state of the art, uh, an amazing, you know, capabilities, uh, especially if we, uh, I, I guess most of you have seen, you know, the Reaper uh, on, on TVs. So just to give you an idea, it's an amazing, uh, you know, drone. But that cost uh, minimum, I would say, 20 million, uh, you know, US dollars. And it's the uh, direct operating costs are around like uh, 8,000 uh, US dollars per hour. With the one that um, we, we have developed, we're talking about, you know, between the basic, uh, basic one and, and the most advanced, so it depends on the type of, you know, uh, gimbals and sensors that you, you decide to carry on. We, we're talking about, you know, 3.5 up to uh, 6 million. So that's the major, you know, uh, decrease. That's number one. For the operating cost, we lower than, uh, 700 euros per hour. So because of that, and, and, and due to the fact that, you know, technologies is uh, improving uh, significantly, uh, things are going to change uh, much faster than we think. And, and um, I believe that um, the beauty with those drones is to uh, collect, uh, you know, aerial, uh, you know, uh, imageries. Uh, at a much cheaper price and, and, and on a real time, so which a satellite cannot really do. So it's at a given uh, time, uh, while, you know, with drones, uh, you, you're going to be, you're going to have the ability to actually monitor at any time uh, of the day, whenever you, you need it. And who would buy this? Who's interested in buying a drone that can give you this type of, of information? Well, um, and, and that, that was part of uh, some of the question that you asked. Um, the market is limited as of today uh, because, you know, um, very difficult to, you know, uh, get the authorization, number one, uh, to fly over specific areas unless, you know, uh, they're 
not very, you know, um, um, or or if let, let's put it that way, uh, if you fly over uh, very low density uh, areas, then it's easy to operate uh, uh, critical operations. Uh, but so. Um, who would buy um, those, uh, those drones? Uh, most of the buyers are, you know, institutions. Um, and, and when I say institutions, I'm thinking about, you know, uh, universities, um, dedicated uh, scientific, uh, you know, uh, companies. Um, and, 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 and I believe that in the future, you know, Denmark and Macro um, as soon as we will solve out, you know, the issue we've uh, detect and uh, avoid. Mm -hmm. You also said on the previous panel that you were hoping to become a data provider. Correct me if I'm wrong. One way that I would, I mean, I come from, as I told, as I said before, I come from formal economics, so I tend to think more about the business than anything else. If for an individual or for a particular institution, buying a drone is very expensive or it's above budget, they could get somebody else to buy the drone and provide the service for them. So is, is that an option as of now? Well, c could we think um, using as a drone just as a device and, and, and have a, a business model like um, based on the one that we call, you know, SAS? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, definitely. Uh, that could be a service at some point. Um, I've, I've, I think, you know, uh, Dera uh, and, and Naveen has explained it uh, extremely well uh, when you think about, you know, WhatsApp, for instance, uh, having the ability to gather uh, data and, and um, pr you know, supply, um, let's put it that way, um, a customized answer to uh, your end user, to the end user, um, by working on and, and defining what he really needs, yes, uh, this is how you are going to monetize uh, your business model. So, yes, uh, getting data, aerial data, I think um, that's a major, um, it's, it's a new era because mm -hmm. we've been talking about it uh, for quite a long time. We've been, you know, using satellites more and more, uh, but uh, from aircraft, I think it's going to be uh, the beginning. Of, of that era where, you know, most of the big players are going to try to uh, get those mm -hmm. uh, information. We were discussing before the concept of carbon footprint, compensating your carbon emissions by a third party. And how, how do you see yourself or your company in, in this scenario? regarding those those topics do you think you could you know provide some sort of solution for that no um, <laughs> I wish I could um, um, I, I, I think you know uh, my goal is just to probably um, for Ecoshore, um you know the so basically um, I was talking about you know deforestation about the fact the fact that protect, protecting forest and and and, and restoring soil remediation uh, could be um, one of the greatest ally uh, in uh, fighting uh, uh, climate change. And, and one of the aspects that uh, where, you know, we still need um, a, a great, I mean, where we need to develop a technology is definitely carbon footprint. How a company can uh, prove that they uh, actually reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that's something that is extremely complicated and, and we won't be able like, to develop that carbon market if, if we don't have uh, that tool, that system. So I believe that uh, for those of you that are you know, uh, great engineers and, and work on, on blockchain, um, there is uh, an avenue for you guys uh, here because we've been talking about bitcoins um, uh, but I, the way I look at, you know, blockchain is more about like uh, uh, not only ledger of, you know, transaction, but ledger of operations. How can we uh, be certain that, you know, a company really reduce its, its greenhouse gas emissions? And uh, uh, that's a very, very 
tough uh, and complex uh, problems to uh, to sort it out. You just mentioned like green bonds, carbon market. That idea has been has existed for quite some time already, but it doesn't seem to be working properly. Do you agree with that? Well, I I, I think uh, yes, I, I I agree, and and one of the reason is the associated cost. You know, at the end of the day, uh, we develop thing only if, you know, if it's convenient, if it's cheaper, uh, and that's not the case. And, and, and the beauty with, uh, I believe, blockchain is to give the ability to reduce, for instance, the audit verifications. Um, so that, that's one part of, of, of the answer, probably, that we could bring here. Let me go back to your drones for, for a sec. What makes your drones special? <laughs> Let's say on that empty chair, you will have a, com a competitor, somebody else's drones. You're pitching your drones to me. Why would I buy your drones and not this invisible guy's drones? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I think, you know, if you have to compare uh, my drone to you know, when you're comparing things, you compare apples to apples, number one. So in the category of drones that we have developed, and I don't know if some of you knows um, Berektar, you know, the Turkish company uh, that are currently deploying, you know, uh, drones uh, in Ukraine. Um, I could give you a lot of, you know, I could make a comparison based on the performances, uh, but not only. Uh, so they are, you know, we, we, we came up with uh, very advanced technologies where we have been able like, to reduce significantly the cost of this drone, their operating uh, system, uh, but, but by keeping you know, uh, uh, the best you know, performances uh, possible. Um, so it's, it's, that's the first aspect of it. Um, then you know, the second aspect, because and I, I think uh, how do I differentiate uh, my company from the others? Most of those companies just want to design and manufacture drones. Um, we don't want it. Uh, I mean, we don't want to be just be specific and, and, and just design and manufacture those drones. I think the future is about you know data. That's where uh, you're going to be a game changer. So um, having the ability to collect uh, and 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 actually proceed that data is, is something where where compared to the rest of the competition we we're pretty good at, I think. And could we imagine this this drones, this technology being used somewhere else, not only dealing with deforestation, but for example agriculture, like the analysis of the soil or something like that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that, and that's the beauty uh, of those uh, unmanned, you know, vehicles. Um, the variety of application is just amazing. Um, agriculture, um, you know, um, monitoring. Um, um, I was talking about, you know, the wildfires. Um, just as of today, uh, we, we don't just don't know how to stop, you know, those fires, except, you know, sending troops out there and, and they do their best uh, as they can. Uh, tomorrow, the, we, we're going to be in a world where we will have data, and, and, and we, with AI, we're going to have the ability to assist uh, decision makers on taking the right, uh, you know, options uh, to take all, for instance, a fire. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think it's just the beginning of what we could envision, but. Um, variety of applications for sure um, and it's you know it's uh, <laughs> it's going to be very challenging let's say you're designing your next drone next generation what would your dream be what what's your hope that a drone can do that today it cannot well I um, at the end of the day, you know, I, I just think that if I can contribute and help uh, the planet um, and, and getting, you know, a better uh, analysis 
of different phenomenon, I think I will have I will have done my job properly. Um, you know, each of us, we, we need to think about, you know, the, the future and, and what we're going to leave. That's what I think. I know that for that young generation, they may be like, hey, what are you talking, guys? Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't ask you to, to do those kind of things. Uh, but I think, um, you know, Naveen was talking about um, those large corporation and, 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 and one aspect that I'm, 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 I totally align with him is the fact that... Uh, Greediness is the major issue at the end of the day. Uh, they want to control um, and, and, and keep their revenues uh, growing year after year. Um, and, 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 and I think we will have to come back to more or less basic uh, decision. Uh, how are we going to, um, you know, um, grow our crop? Um, uh, because agriculture is going to be fundamental, the ecosystem is going to be, you know, part of it, and we have to preserve it. So, you know, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to tell you that, you know, my goal is just to be part of, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. an ecosystem. There's a, there's a concept in economics that's called, that deals with this issue that's called degrowth. You know, mainstream economics used to talk about... You know, Grow, you know, growing GDP is always good, but now we come to these situations where, as you mentioned, if population by the year 2050 requires this much more food, this much new water, blah, 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 then that simply is not sustainable. So there are new lines of thought that are talking about degrowth, going back to, not say basics, but somewhere, some, some sort of uh, steady state where economics and environmental issues finds, find a, a middle point, you know? And I think what you guys are, are doing with, with this technology, with this, you know, this, this information that you're, you're gathering, it's on that line. But the question perhaps is, are you strong enough? Like, the, is the movement strong enough? Because you were... You were a bit pessimistic about the future when we, we started this conversation. And I have to say that I kind of agree. I don't think the future is saved. I think there's a, an apocalypse, apocalyptic future waiting, perhaps not for us but, or our kids, but for our grandkids, almost at the rate that things are going now, it's almost certain, in my view. Do you agree with that? Do you, what were your thoughts on it? Um, that's uh, another tough uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's what they pay me for, uh, to bother the speaker. I can tell. <laughs> um, I, I, so, for sure, um, there is one aspect um, that we probably don't think on a daily basis is how we consume. Um, and each of us, uh, and I'm the first one, you know, uh, trying to change things, but in the meantime, I'm a consumer. On a daily basis, I'm using my, my exactly <laughs> laptop, <laughs> mobiles, um, and even about blockchain. I'm asking you, um, you know, this question to you guys. Um, you have to store that data, so um, there is a carbon footprint here. So wh what I'm trying to tell you is that um, it's it's going to be very difficult to change, you know, the entire you know economic system. That we, that on which we have established, are fundamentals. Um, however, I, I I just believe that um, we 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 need to change the way we consume. Uh, when you think about textile, you know, um, and one of the reasons you know I've been involved in those projects is because I've been traveling quite oftenly uh, to Africa. And when you go to Ghana and you see all that, those mountains of, you know, closing, you're just amazed. You're like, we, we don't recycle anything. Um, and and that, that's why, you know, we've uh, Ecoshar, um, the, the company that I was introduced you to, uh, the idea is, is to, and, and part of the deforestation, because, you, you, you know, what, what, what are the, you know, the causes? Um, it's linked to agriculture, 
and secondly, uh, to you know, mainly about firewood. So those population need you know, to use uh, charcoal on a daily basis. Uh, they don't have necessarily electricity everywhere. They, you don't have any grade, and so it, it means that the, the main my my way of thinking is um, we we need to um, manage uh, those resources and 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 really uh, recycle all of them. Uh, there is what we call the finitude of uh, finitude of resources. So um, you know uh, you you need to think uh, it's one planet and and when you have uh, used most of it. It's, it's over. So to get back to your question, um, the bad news is I, um, as, as an entrepreneur, I really wanted like, to focus on sustainable development. But you know, uh, the Ministry of Defense came to me um, and, and, and told me, Brace, you, you have an heavy drone. Um, heavy drones are going to play a major role in, in the years to come because we, we see uh, instability. Uh, that is that may occur over the years, and 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 I, I'd like to to tell you well, uh, my focus is going to be on 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 you know sustainable um, development. I think we all live on the same planet. We should be united um, and 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 really take all those big challenges right now, because it's going to be otherwise you know too late. Uh, and and so I I don't want to be too much pessimistic, but um, we need action, real action now. So carbon market, for instance, carbon footprint, uh, carbon offsets, those are the kind of thing that we need to Wait, definitely does develop. Does everybody know what those concepts mean? Raise your hand if you're familiar with the, with the concepts. Too well. <laughs> Perhaps you can elaborate a little bit on, on each. Yeah. Um, so. Carbon offset is uh, basically uh, for those of you guys who buy like stuff. At, you know, let's let's put it that way. Uh, Zara, for instance, a retailing company, um, they have a carbon footprint. So to produce, you know, when you look at the entire supply chain from A to Z, um, you're gonna try to uh, assess the level of uh, greenhouse gas emission that they emit, and and one of the you know the challenge now, uh, due to the fact that they want to communicate on the fact that they're trying to reduce their uh, carbon f uh, well carbon footprint, uh, is that they may either you know improve those uh, th their supply chain by you know reducing the level of emission by, I don't know, it, can, it could be from, you know, uh, the... Um, 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 recycling? Recycling uh, process uh, from uh, the uh, just uh, production uh, facility itself, um, or eventually pay other companies to compensate uh, their emission by uh, implementing uh, green projects. And, and EcoShar is one of them. So. Typically, we, we, we will give them the ability to um, actually finance some of the project that we may have and uh, demonstrate that uh, what we do will have a you know, positive impact on the environment uh, by reducing uh, mostly uh, the emission of uh, greenhouse gas that we have. So, to see if I understand this correctly, a particular company let's say it will not or it cannot reduce its carbon footprint, but it can pay you guys in order, like, in order to compensate, something like that? Is that the way it would work? Uh, that, that's, well, yeah, it's a bit more complex, but yeah. Um, of course, internally they have to work on how can we improve uh, and decrease the level of emission we having. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they are going to you know look at each segment of the production line till you know they for instance for the retailing companies so it's, it's like you're doing the, the the job for them 
they don't reduce your carbon footprint, you're, redu you're reducing it? No, uh, here they're reducing by themselves, okay? Uh, and, and of course, uh, you have some obstacle limits to that level. And this is where we can, you know, actually uh, play a, a key role for those companies. So we, we're going to try to um, implement projects uh, having, um, you know, so basically the one so that you, you better understand what I'm, um, we, we do with Ecoshar, um, we, we use uh, at the order of the technology, it's called uh, pyrolysis. So it's a, a thermochemical uh, process that convert biomass organic waste, in other words, onto, um, you know, biochar. I don't know if you've ever heard, uh, for some of you, biochar. But biochar has some very uh, attractive uh, attributes. Um, it stimulates, you know, um, um, water, uh, retain, uh, water retention potential, uh, the nutrition uh, uh, retention as well. Um, uh, you can, you know, get, um, you know, basically you restore land degraded uh, with Bioshar. Now, if you um, aggregate Bioshar, you produce an alternative to uh, wood charcoal. Um, and then, you know, we stop logging those forests. So that's one way to protect uh, forest. But the and, and, and so because of that, you know, we we are monitored by third parties that are going to check out that what we do, okay, from a carbon standpoint. But does that technology already exist? Yeah. And why is it not widely adopted by the world? Why are we still using coal? Well, uh, that's, a, that, that's a good question. Uh, w one of the major issues was that... Um, Chemical companies. Um, I've done some a good job, like with lobbyists. Um, so uh, basically, um, you have, uh, um, and and I didn't mention this uh, to to <laughs> to insist about the fact that we need to uh, act uh, really urgently. By 2050, 90 percent of the land could be degraded. So I, I don't know if you can imagine, but no one is talking about the fact that the yield of agricultures have decreased over the last two decades. So they're using, you know, the intensification of, um, you know, uh, agricultural practices, uh, and 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 have actually uh, decreased uh, significantly. Uh, the yield of those uh, lands. So, so all the increase in volume was because of more land being being worked on. So so basically because yes, they're the not as fertile as before. Yes, we go and, and cut off some new trees, uh, and, and 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 that's part of the equation. Yes, that's the major problem. So um, we're gonna have we're gonna face a, a major increase uh, in terms of population, and our soil land are going to be degraded. So uh, we we're really talking about our survival here. How can we feed all that population in the years to come? You just keep bringing on the bad news, Fabrice. <laughs> anything anything positive that you see in the in our future? No, no. I I, I think you know everything is possible. Uh, don't get me wrong. Um, I just think that the community, uh, you and each of us, needs to do what we can. Um, and that's what I like about, you know, uh, blockchain. It's decentralized. Each of us uh, can contribute. Um, we, we, I'm, that, that's, 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 you know, the solution. It's from us, uh, not from the government. That's what I, I, I strongly believe in. I agree. We hate government. <laughs> Let me ask you about the company for a second. Give us a, a description of how the company is structured, how many people are working there, specifically what's your your role in the company, a bit a bit of background on on it. So um, I guess you want to know about the drones uh, one, right? No, you 
you get to okay. pick. Well, all right. You're the main speaker here, so <laughs> choose whatever you think the audience is more interested in. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, so, um, so we, we took over a company um, uh, in 2020. Um, we we have like a little bit less than 50 people at the moment. Okay. Uh, but we in the ramp up process. Uh, so we we discussing to uh, establish a first facility in, in the U.S. Um, one in Indonesia. All right. Um, and and we we currently you know uh, working with uh, and that's what I like uh, with different universities. Each of them you know bring us like um, very advanced bricks technology. Called bricks worldwide or in France? No, 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 on the worldwide uh, scope. Um, and uh, because of that, we 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 trying to develop um, very advanced uh, solutions. Uh, so that are entirely new. Uh, for instance, if we go back to uh, wildfires, um, no one has developed anything like you know the stuff that we're doing. So we will have you know uh, three stages. Uh, um, a three stages uh, approach where uh, we're going to work on prevention. So uh, those drones are going to fly over, you know, those forests. They're going to map uh, each, uh, you know, uh, square foot centimeters of the forest, and 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 we will know, you know, the type of trees that grow on uh, those areas, and and then we'll be able like to uh, establish. Uh, through uh, AI, based on on the weather conditions, winds, and uh, other parameters, um, the you know uh, to to assess uh, where some fires could uh, actually uh, appear. exactly yeah. appear, and so we we will have patterns for those drones, and they will fly uh, most of the time, so that uh, we know exactly when it's going to happen, and and be able like to. Uh, move as quick as we can to you know uh, end up those uh, those fires. Yeah, so that's one of the approach. Um, so that's prevention, uh, detection, and 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 the big big approach that we're working on is to coordinate to coordinate you know all these endeavors with uh, uh, the the troops uh, on ground. So we are going to um, actually. Um, counter uh, who and what kind of equipment can be available, uh, how we could, you know, uh, tackle the fires based on, on different parameters uh, and, 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 and um, supply and provide uh, to the uh, commander, commander center, you know, the right um, action plan. So um, I think it's going to be unique and uh, I hope it's going to be useful for, for the planet. Hopefully. Another question. Let's say somebody here from the audience wants to get a job at your company. What type of profile are, are you guys looking for at the moment? Um, so we have uh, two segments that uh, we're really working on. One is, uh, you know, the hardware, so the development of the drones. So basically, it's uh, going to be like uh, engineer technicians uh, from the aer aer aerospace industry. All right, and and the second aspect is um, developing, you know, algorithms uh, for data. So we we using you know a lot of uh, you know engineer um, people who have PhDs and stuff like that to develop those uh, algorithms, and and you know support us for the um, data collection. You want the smart ones. We try to <laughs> yes to yes to recruit like uh, very sm talented people. Excellent. Uh, do you feel we should open the mic to our audience? Sure, sure. Anybody feel like asking our drone expert anything? Of course we do. Uh, let me see if I can get you the mic, Elson. Thank you. 
Pozitív vagy negatív And this, oh, sorry, the general status of, of what's going on. My personal problem, for instance, is that I don't trust the information given to us. I don't trust the news. I don't, especially politicians, I feel that they utilize the fact of that, you know, uh, recycling and this and that. And I'm, I'm a grandmother for two, so definitely the future is a great concern to me. So what should we do what were the or what are the hands on actions what are the actual talks uh, the real things that we should be saying and on the other hand showcasing or proving that for instance the the drones doing the job for us the data is accurate it's correct it's not manipulated but we can truly trust all of that and people would start really understanding that what's going on here and, and like you said that we need immediate actions yesterday <laughs> well uh, I, I think one of the concepts that we, we didn't really talk about is uh, data integrity and it's all about that at the end of the day how can I make sure that uh, the data that is uh, showing up is the right one um, I'm not sure, you know, I, I have the, the right answer. Um, I'm not, and I, I think you, you, you understood that I'm, I'm not a, an expert on, on blockchain. I, however, I see that it can contribute uh, to bring the right data and, and, and make sure that uh, we collect and, and we use it as, I mean, adequately. So um, I totally agree with you. Uh, it's a major concern, especially when you're collecting uh, data, uh, because what is behind, you know, and how are you going to use it? Uh, those are the kind of uh, stuff that I'm, I'm, I'm w that we can be very doubtful of. Um, so um, I, I, I think uh, you know you raised the, the, the right the right question. Uh, on my side is. Uh, as an entrepreneur, um, is to make sure that um, we get uh, that data and, and, and it remains and, and do exactly what we expect. Um, but that, that's, you know, here, the, the young generation uh, who are going to develop those algorithms, uh, they have to, uh, because it's, it's, it's you know, um, we're we facing an unprecedented uh, challenge. And um, I think that those guys really need to help us as well. You know, most of the time, you know, and, and you're lucky because I don't have any children. I, I wish I had. But, um, well, it's complicated. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But, um, you know, most of the time it's true that um, I've, I've got the feeling that, you know, uh, Leandro's uh, generation, mine, yours, some of yours, guys, um, we, we understand that... Uh, we need to move ahead. The young generation is like, hey guys, we didn't ask for anything. And look, what, what, and, and they're right. They're right, you know, you they and have, I. They have to clean up our mess. Exactly. Uh, if, if we pretend that we are civilized, we really need to, and it's time. And, and I think that uh, part of the issue is, uh, I mean, to me, is that I uh, integrity. So I'm sorry, I'd like to, you know, elaborate and, <laughs> and, and, and and demonstrate what we should do, I don't have that answer yet. I believe they may come up with the, the right answer. I, f I think blockchain is, and, and if anyone has an idea to, to answer that question, please feel free to, uh, to answer. But um, it's gonna be one of, one of the challenges as well.
and it always has been. You know, for carb carbon footprint, for instance, that's the major issue. Transparency versus opacity. How do we, you know, end all those things? Can I? Yes. Uh, can you hear me, guys? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I probably had a very similar question to Anita, but um, my concern is we're talking about decentralization. We're talking anonymous transactions on blockchain. We're talking staying anonymous. And at the same time, we're using our phones. It's the biggest uh, surveillance at the moment for us that we, we carry with us all the time. All the time. And we're not mentioning that, but we want to be decentralized. At the same time, uh, we're easily talking about these drones. It's another surveillance mechanism that we somehow very freely and uh, accepting, oh, this is for the good cause. I'm somehow not buying into that, to be honest. Um, according to predictions of um, global warming ambassadors, without mentioning any names, uh, they predicted it over 20 years ago, by today, all the ice supposed to be melted and we're supposed to be under the water now. So predictions you, 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 you're describing uh, or painting um, for the next 50 years or 30 years from now, even less actually, yeah. Uh, I somehow, I, I find it extremely hard to believe. And another thing I mentioned I would know too well about carbon is uh, the carbon uh, credits. This everyone probably heard about it. How can you possibly offer a credit of something that you don't own? And to me, it's the biggest problem I'm, I'm with my, I, I, don't, I don't understand that, and I don't agree with that. I'm not sure, this wasn't a question, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you comment on it then? Yeah, well, what do you think? Yeah, um, about the first uh, uh, question that you, you, you raised, I just want to make sure. So you, you don't believe that things, um, that by, you know, by 20, 30, 50, um, things will uh, be as dramatic as, as I, I, I did describe them? Absolutely not. Well, okay. Um, I'm going to give you some figures because, you know, I've been to Africa and I'm going to tell you what I've seen. Um, so, in 2003, um, Ivory Coast had the same surface in terms of forest than frames. So we were talking more or less about 16 million hectares of forest. And um, over the last two decades on my side, I've been there. And I can tell you, um, I, I didn't mention, but most of tropical uh, forests obviously are affected. And as of today, um, we count less than 3.5 million hectares. And I can tell you that I believe that we still overestimated that figure. And what for? <laughs> well, we, we cut off like all those trees for agricultural lands and etc. Cetera, et cetera. So um, I could give you, you know, Ivory Coast, Uganda, by 2030, by, by 2030, okay, Uganda could lose most of its uh, forest. Um, you were talking about, you know, water. Um, I have a, you know, scientific background. I was specialized in quantum mechanics. Um, people think that, uh, oh, it's going to happen in one day when we're talking about, you know, water is melting. No, it's going to be a long process, a very long process. Um, I just think that, you know, if you really, um, they, I'm not, I'm not think, telling you it's black and white. Uh, but what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tell you is that um, very few, you know, media talked about, you know, what happened in Pakistan this summer. When you think about the flood, they have flooding every year. But the one that they were facing this year was to an extent that we never faced before. And we talked about 30 million people migrating from one place to another. And um, I'm French, I probably, I don't know if you saw the, the, you know, the wildfires that we had in France. 
we were not capable of you know stopping anything anything and and I live you know in Paris during the summer you know um, it's supposed to be hot but but right now it's just unbelievable um, um, yeah it's it's extremely hot it's like we don't have any AC I've seen rivers that are were totally you know dried totally dried so my question then for you <laughs> is, okay, I, I do understand that people may think that, no, it's not happening. All right, let's assume it's not. How do you explain that we facing more, uh, you know, more friendly um, disasters all over the world? All over the world. I could give you a very specific, um, you know, business case with Florida. Um, you know, I, I want to actually, I was talking about the drones where I want to install the facility. And, and I started working on, on a major problem that they have. It's called the red tide. What is the red tide? So, yeah, exactly. I, I, I can tell you know about it. And, and do you know what is the cause? All right. So, in Florida, you have been using, you know, chemical fertilizer for quite a long time, NPK, all right? Um, and what happened is like when you have heavy rain and because now the, the temperature are, have increased also significantly, well, you have a runoff of nutrient that goes to the ocean. So algae has always been there, but the difference now is that they have all the conditions to grow ext extremely rapidly. So it's called the armful uh, algae blooms, right? So to get back to your question now, and we've seen this in the US for the last few years, and it's, 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 it's a real drama. You see the entire ecosystem that is gonna disappear. You know, we're talking about fish, um, you know, the entire, you know, f f fauna and flora there that are g getting killed. So, again, I'm like you. Uh, uh, I believe in technology, and, and, and the proof is that if we come up with, you know, Bioshar, for instance, we could stop it because um, the attributes, and I'd be more than happy to exchange uh, with some of you if, you if you're interested, but to get back to your point, you know, um, I've done this for the last 20 years. I, I, I got the chance to uh, get educated, go to school. And my contribution is to, you know, use my brain to solve out those problems. I won't be able like, to solve out everything. But I can tell you, um, if we don't do anything, and, 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 and I don't want to be too pessimistic because you're going to be always crazy. <laughs> but if we don't do anything, uh, I'm guarantee you it's not by 2050 that we'd be talking about that. In the next five years, it's going to be difficult to survive. And I'm talking about surviving. Um, you know, no one wants to talk about, you know, agriculture wall yields today. And they have decreased significantly. So how do you feed? all the population on Earth. Well, my way of thinking is, uh, you know, uh, we're not part of the nature. That's the drama. The beauty of nature has been, you know, um, ignored for too long. And, and if we want to survive, we better now uh, to understand that we, we're part of that ecosystem. So we need to preserve it and respect it. Um, otherwise, you know, um, if you really want to know my background, I started working in the oil and gas <laughs> industry. Um, and I was like, hey, uh, Fabrice, come over. Uh, we want you to develop, because I've, I've, I've developed disruptive technologies for quite a long time. Uh, and many of them I could, I could list if, you, if, you, if you're interested, and I, I sold them out. Um, and I'm telling you, um, it's, it's, no, no, it's, the, the situation is, 
is, is worse than we think. Uh, I shouldn't tell you this, because at the end of the day, I want you to be uh, positive and think we're going to be able like, to make it, and we can. If we are united and change our way of living, yes. But when you consume, look, it's always you want you know, that water here. You don't care how it was produced. Well, we need to think of it. We need to think, like, when I'm, 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 I'm wearing clothes, is it difficult to uh, recycle clothes and, and make new clothes with all this? No, but it's, it's, that's where these, I mean, the stake is there. Yeah. I know we all leave too much rubbish behind. I completely agree with that. I'm just questioning this weather, apparent, uh, apparent global warming, and somehow I'm finding very hard to, to buy it, based especially on, on past predictions that uh, did not come through. Um, the IPCC. And that, was my, that was my main point, that's all. concerns prevented those those um so the predictions were prevented because actions were taken so even though in 30 years ago they said oh we're going to be up to our necks in water the reason we're not is because 30 years ago they took action this is the same argument that was made about acid rain in north america is they took actions and so it prevented those things so because they didn't happen it was because actions were taken, not because they were not taken. And th th that, that's, I think, gets forgotten, is that uh, these bad predictions can be prevented if we take actions. And that's a good example of actions taken, results found, or results happened. Can I still keep the mic here for a while, William? Is it okay? <laughs> yeah, right. Sorry to keep it in this corner. Uh, this is beautiful discussion, debate even, I'd say. First, I need to point out that nobody believes in the data. I'm on this side of this kind of de debate and discussion. I don't believe anything what you say, I don't believe anything what he says, <laughs> nothing, not whatsoever, because all the data is so manipulated now. And that's, that's the biggest problem. And let's go back to the topic of this great event, blockchain. And this is now a little bit problem for me to understand, because you are as centralized as WhatsApp is when you explain your business. You're collecting the data and you're selling it to somewhere who's using the data the way they want, that they may, the way they want to manipulate it. So uh, blockchain is so early technology yet, but we will have the answers to have the more trusted data in the future, but not today. But how do you implement blockchain technology for your business today? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm limited in that perspective. I, I wish I could, you know, um, here you have like um, software engineers. Um, it's, we agree that uh, it's, it's a major concern. Uh, there is no question. Um, but as expressed, data integrity. I don't think, you know, every data is, is transformed or um, we have, you know, some is, is, can be used as it is. Um, the one here that I'm, I'm trying to develop so that you understand blockchain as and is going to play a key role because tracking drones um, or just making sure that you know um, machine learning we, we, we developing machine learning algorithms. So I can to in interview a little bit yeah. what I'm saying here is when you sell your data further it can be okay from your side but then it's manipulated afterwards and that is the biggest problem. When it's on blockchain, it's immutable. And that's what we need to have. And that's the question was, again, if you don't know the answer, I, I'd rather pass this mic to William, who's an expert on everything. William. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, have, I have two questions. The first one is... Um, I believe that entertainment is a powerful tool for attention, 
And I also believe that sunlight is the greatest disinfectant. So I think that if everyone's attention was on this and they were able to like, really understand what's going on in the world, there will be innovation and ideas and things that will come out of that attention. So my question is with your blockchain, like, can the oracle of your blockchain feed into different video games, different data visualization sites, different ways to make it entertaining for people to understand this uh, great concept that's going on? Let me stop you there. He, he didn't develop a blockchain. He has a, a drone company. I, I understand, but the, the data is on chain, correct? Or am I mistaken on that? Yeah. Part of the process is something that we're currently working on, is to integrate blockchain uh, system. Uh, it's a private chain. Yeah. It's a private chain, no blockchain. OK. All right, and um, my other question was, um, I understand that carbon credits and helping and companies that want to help out the environment um, is a awesome industry. Um, I'm also from New York where I believe that litigation is a form of communication sometimes, <laughs> right? And um, I would like to know that if you guys are doing the other side of that, because like you mentioned with the algae bloom and things like um, environmental um, crimes, it's actually against the laws that we have in a lot of these countries, but they lack the evidence to be able to litigate against these companies. So would you ever see some of the drone data that you're collecting being used as evidence against some of the larger corporations to try to communicate to them how important this problem is? I've, to tell you the truth, I've never been faced to uh, that concern yet. Uh, um, from a military you know, background, I would say, um, and, and this is where you you know, the person told me, like, uh, yes, they could, you are going to, you know, collect information to them, and what do they do with that information? Uh, we don't have any control. That's true. Um, that's why, you know, when you work on sustainability, that's what I like. Uh, we do uh, things that are operational uh, and may have a direct impact. You can see what we do. All right. Um, We've, you know, the defense sector, I totally agree. Um, you, you asked many questions earlier. Um, if, you know, tomorrow um, is going to be different with the use of, you know, self-driving vehicle that could, you know, do whatever they want. How do, you, do we control this? As of today, um, I can only tell you that in the U.S., uh, France or the NATO countries, um, those are very um, specific topics that they really care of and where they have set up, you know, limits. But for how long? I, I don't know. Um, this is where, you know, I see, you know, the blockchain as a very powerful tool for sustainability again. Um, as, as soon as you provide, you know, information to governments, it's a different story, and I'd be like, you know, fool to tell you, oh, I will control this, because I'm, I'm going to be like anyone else. At the end of the day, I need to make money so that I can live like anyone else. So, um, and, 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 and that's, you know, a uh, very inspiring aspect of blockchain, I think, from my perspective. You know, I don't look at, you know, bitcoins like uh, so ledger of transactions, a ledger of, um, you know, operations. Thank you. I appreciate it. I have it. one, the other question. That is totally related to the drones, and, and you asked about, like, the uses of drones. Some years back, um, I was, um, well, working for a person who was in, in our business area, our industry, and she used to say that the drones, for instance, uh, could be, or even should be, used in the case of uh, providing when there is a, you know, natural catastrophe or, or a war situation, when the infrastructure of, of a nation, of a country, might have been destroyed completely. 
and for instance, which would mean that there is no electricity or, or any of the kind. So drones could act, for instance, uh, as nodes and, and be able to, you know, fly up to the sky and, and high up be, you know, not to be seen or, or uh, necessarily being shot down or whatever. I found it very futuristic idea, but kind of interesting. So could you see anything similar of the kind where the drones could be used in case of a, you know, especially in infrastructure uh, catastrophe or, or similar? Yeah, I, um, I, I, I believe that um, we, we're currently working like any, you know, over like uh, drone companies on swarm drones. So, and those, so all those drones could be used as a mesh system, for instance. Um, and that's part of the answer for uh, firefighting uh, operations. Um, they don't know what's going on, or if you think about the flooding that happened, you know, in Pakistan, very difficult to uh, assess what happened. How do you do those uh, search and rescue? Uh, it's very costly, you know, when you use, you know, um, like, Aircraft, th those costs are extremely expensive. And, and that's the reason why, you know, uh, even if it's a catastrophe, we don't do it. Unless, you know, you're the US or like a very rich country, uh, like China, some of them, of course, can, can afford it. Um, but in those areas, they can't. I believe that if those kind of catastrophe would happen also uh, in France, not sure that we, we, we would have the ability to do this. Um, so yes, I, I think that that's the potential. Uh, and that's why, you know, instead of using, you know, the word drones, I like to use um, aerial observation platform. So you do different type of missions. Um, I had a you know, question about how to differentiate ourselves from the rest of the competition. Um, we have developed drones that can, you know, uh, can, you know, in, in, within an, less than an hour, you do totally like different missions with it. So, uh, you know, you can carry on because it's it's very difficult in the aerospace sector to, you know, contrary to what we think, to, um, to customize a aircraft for specific missions. So that's one of the the thing that we've we've been working on. So. Um, there, there are many questions that where I'm not an expert and good enough to answer to 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 your uh, uh, to 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 give the appropriate answer. What I can tell you is that um, for sure, um, I, I believe that uh, you know the combination of drones plus blockchain can help for sustainability. And and I'm I'm a you know uh, really believer that you you can change things, guys. So. Come and help us. <laughs> Hi. So I have uh, three questions, drone re related, not at all related to blockchain or data. <laughs> okay. So uh, I was earlier in the solar industry, that was renewable energy industry, and the major issues which we face were like, uh, say, uh, if it was a land based utility based solar power plants, then it was the contour of the, I mean, site survey, I mean, contour, so using uh, drones. And another thing was, if it was like a rooftop uh, based solar uh, for, say, sheet metal roof uh, in uh, big structures, you know, I mean, uh, like uh, warehouses and all, right? We have the sheet metal on the roof of the warehouse. So, uh, in order to put solar over there, we need to know the number of ribs over there, the spacing of the ribs on the uh, on the solar rooftop. So, it was very site survey on these. Uh, I mean, platforms are very difficult, actually, very hot out there. So sheet metal, tin roof, actually, very difficult. So, uh, I mean, we did try to explore the usage of drones over there, but uh, one, uh, the data capture wasn't too uh, too good at, at that point of time. I was talking, I'm talking about three, four years back, actually. Not sure how it is right now. Uh, so how advanced it is with respect to your drone company? Uh, I mean, uh, like, say, how how intricate can you, like, say, okay, the spacing between ribs uh, like that on the sheet metal roof? And second thing, is it easy to uh, get a contour of a particular piece of land based on the GPS coordinates? 
uh, as accurate, uh, how accurate is that actually? Well, ups and downs, of, uh, I mean, where the pawns can be there. No, you're getting my point, right? And that, uh, and another question, uh, third question actually. So, uh, I mean, I, I heard about Flash Forest uh, Canada. I mean, it does uh, seeding and, uh, and uh, reforestation uh, I mean, using drones, actually. I mean, so uh, how do you guys, like, do you, I mean, do you, like, work with them or you have your own program? So any idea, you can, like, shed light on that. Uh, okay. So about, because I'm, I'm not sure that I got the, the second question, but the further, regarding the first one, um, yeah, uh, the type of sensor is... is uh, um, um, one of the major, um, you know, advantage that we may have because we, all depending on what you're going to do, but um, we 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 take you know uh, the most advanced technology uh, and and try to carry on those those technologies. So uh, for the type, uh, uh, you know, of solar panels put on the roof, for instance, not sure that uh, we would have the appropriate drones uh, because we're talking about heavy drones here. So just to give you an idea. Um, Wingspan, we're talking about more or less eight meters. Uh, length would be uh, would exceed uh, six meters. So it's it's a big big drone. Um, you may no, I'm not talking about installation of panels. I'm talking about site survey, initial site survey. So to uh, come up with an estimate of uh, what is the capacity of the roof, you know, getting a point. I mean, the installation can happen uh, maybe s six months down the line. That's not what we're looking at. We're looking at the potential roof. Instead of the uh, sites of engineer climbing on top of the roof, which is like a bit very risky, right? There are skylights on the roof and all. So the drone actually does the part of uh, the drone operator, drone pilot. He will actually, uh, I mean, that uh, drone will go on the roof and then see the, what is the, uh, I mean, uh, type of roof is there. What is the spacing between the ribs? So like, what kind of clamps can be, uh, I mean, used on the, on the, on the, uh, I mean, on the roof to hold the panels. Um, I, Side survey. <laughs> Side survey. I, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, give you the right answer, but, but probably so that you, you understand. Um, we would put different uh, sensors, okay? And the mix of them would uh, give us the ability to extract uh, the right information that you're trying to seek. Um, so, um, hyperspectral, LIDAR, um, uh, IR, gimbals, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and, and, and the difference that you may have between, you know, different competitors, it's just the quality of the sensor that you are going to use. So uh, you were telling me that the measurement that you made a few years ago were not as, or, you know, accurate enough, if I do understand uh, correctly. Right. Um, well, all depends on, on the, you know, uh, the technology that have been used here. Um, um, so um, <laughs> difficult to... Um, because like usually you know um, what we try to do is like to uh, discuss with the clients uh, what do you intend to do what do you want to actually what is the type of information that you need and from there uh, we do you know caliber and try to identify the right sensor that we're going to use okay um, so um, maybe they, they were not using the right one but what I can tell you is now like you have uh, amazing technologies available at, 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 at you know, at, at very cheap uh, price. There is no question, you know, uh, about this. So, uh, so second question: uh, the uh, contour of the land. I mean, if it's like a huge, vast area, like if say farmland or something, right? If, I mean, if you want to know where the uh, uh, trough is, where the I mean, uh, I mean, uh, uh, peak is and all. You're getting my point. How do you get the? Uh, is it? Uh, Without a site, doing a proper site, it's a way using a dumpy or something on the ground. Uh, is it possible to like uh, using the drone get the proper ups and downs of the land based on the coordinates, GPS coordinates? He wants to know if you can see like the peaks and the valleys. With yeah, when we do mapping, for instance, okay, with with any lidar, you would be able like to do this. Uh, so the three D mapping would be uh, not an issue at all. Uh, today. Uh, uh, so yes, uh, that's totally feasible. It's quite accurate, uh, accurate at the moment. Yeah. It can be very accurate, yes. Okay. Again, um, 
it's like you know buying a car. Uh, all depends on what type of cars do you want. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want, you know, Porsche or uh, any, you know, uh, cheaper. Yeah. So it low it, level. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah, it can be very accurate. There is no question now. Okay. And third question about, uh, say, uh, afforestation. Uh, for example, this uh, company uh, like Flash Forest is uh, from based in Canada. It does, uh, uh, I mean, uh, seeding, uh, I mean, and uh, afforestation uh, through use of drones, actually. So uh, does your company also participate in such programs? Uh, we are talking about... Uh, no, um, I, I think we complete each other very well. Uh, those, those companies uh, actually have uh, VTOL, so they're, they have, you know, to develop smaller drones than we do, okay? Um, and yes, it's, it's just amazing what they're doing. So uh, uh, sitting, you know, uh, putting those seats uh, almost everywhere uh, with those drones, uh, it's just uh, part of one of the application that, you know, that can change uh, the future. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you to all of you. Guys, we are almost out of time, so if there's uh, one last final question, short question, we can take it. If not, we can call it a day. One last question? No. From that. <laughs> Anybody else wants to take a shot at the last question? No? Okay, so we can let Fabrice go unharmed. Yeah. You survived. Well done. Good job. <laughs> So that completes uh, the session for the day. And if I'm not mistaken, the rest of the, the afternoon, you can use it to network. And there's some offices on the top floor if you want to have some private conversations with each other. That's also available. Well, I think you did great. And you <laughs> ended the, the day well. So I have nothing more to say except uh, see you tomorrow, guys, for a second day. Very interesting, too. And uh, thank you for coming. And uh, enjoy your evening. <laughs>